All right, guys, welcome to tonight's show. Tonight's show is Mr. King, Tracer of Lost Persons. This show was one of radio's longest running shows. It ran from October 12, 1937, all the way to April 19, 1955. And even then, it continued onto television. It was based on a 1906 novel written by Robert W. Chambers. Of course, the name of that novel was The Tracer of Lost Persons. The show started off on the Blue Network until 1947, and then it switched over to CBS. I think the shows that are ran here tonight are mostly from CBS. Out of the 1,690 episodes that were made, only about 59 still survive today. So if you're a fan of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, Nick Carter, Master Detective, and The Adventures of the Falcon, you'll probably enjoy this show. So thanks for tuning in to Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. Keen Tracer of Lost Persons is on the air. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Kalanos Toothpaste present Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night from 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, the famous old investigator will take from his files and bring to us one of his most celebrated missing person cases. But first, is your smile everything you'd like it to be? Bright, sparkling, magnetic? If not, try the new Colonel's toothpaste thousands are raving about. It's a high-polishing toothpaste that acts like a jeweler's polish in removing tarnish from silver. Quickly, but also gently, Kalinos erases stubborn surface film from your teeth, revealing all their glorious natural brilliance. Get Kalinos. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Kalinos toothpaste at your drugstore tonight. Now, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost person. This time, our story opens about a hundred miles from New York in a chemical plant in Connecticut. There's a hum of motors and the hiss of compressed air as Mr. Keene and his assistant, Mike Clancy, are guided across the floor amid great vats and retorts. Halfway across the floor, their guide, a thin, nearsighted man, pauses to answer a question. Oh, yes, Mr. Keene. Our production right now is entirely for the war. And I gather, Mr. Wallace, that this plant supplies chemicals for various types of explosives? Oh, yes. The shells, bombs, mines. Mine, mine, mine. Look at the size of them big bats over there. <laughs> Hitler wouldn't like to think of all the shooting that's going to come out of them, I'll bet. Quite right, Miss Clancy, quite right. And that may have a lot to do with the reason that our manager, Mr. Morley, has sent for you two gentlemen. Well, why did he, Mr. Wallace? All I know is that he phoned my office yesterday in New York and asked me to come here the first thing this morning. What's happened? Well, I'm only in the personnel division. I'll have to let Mr. Morley talk for himself. If you come along to his office, uh, over there on the right. No, sir. Must be on the left. Uh, the left? Well, yes, there's the sign. Manager. Oh, yes, yes. Forgive me for not knowing the way around my own plan. But I've broken my glasses, you see. I'm very nearsighted. Never mind, Mr. Wallace. We'll guide you. In fact, here we are right now. Yeah. One moment while I knock. Come in. Good morning, Mr. Morley. Oh, good morning. Uh, you must be Mr. Keene. That's right. This is my assistant, Mike Clancy. Glad to meet you. How do you do, Mr. Clancy? Uh, won't you come inside, please, gentlemen? You too, Wallace. Yes. All right, now, if you just sit down and make yourselves comfortable. Thank you. Now then, Mr. Morley, what's it all about? Well, I'll come right to the point, Mr. Keene. As you've probably noticed, this is a war plant and a very busy one. Okay. Right now, we're, well, we've just received a very serious threat to our production. How? By the disappearance of a member of our staff. In fact, our best chemical engineer. Mm, that is serious. There is another man in the plant who has his know-how. We must get him back as soon as possible. What's this man's name? Henry Trevor. And how old? Forty-two or so. Mm -hmm. When did he disappear? Three days ago. Under what circumstances? Well, I'll, uh, 
Now, look, Wallace here, tell you. Uh, well, sir, it was late Monday afternoon. I went to Mr. Trevor's office to check a personnel matter, but he didn't have time to talk to me. He already had his hat and coat on, was leaving the plant. Uh, not that he was a clock watcher. Oh, no, indeed. Continue, please. Well, Mr. Keene, there isn't much more to tell. Mr. Trevor left the plant and just never returned. You checked at his home? Well, he has lodgings, but he never slept in his bed that night. Mm -hmm. Was he in any sort of private difficulties? Oh, none at all. Unless Wallace here has an idea. Oh, what is it, Mr. Wallace? You've heard how valuable Mr. Trevor is to us. Obviously, if anybody stands to profit from his disappearance... Well, are you hinting that his disappearance may be the work of enemy agents? Yes, Mr. Key. Glory be. I don't know whether I'm permitted to tell you, but uh, perhaps Mr. Morley... Oh, I think I can refer to it in a general way. Mr. Keene, this plant has been working on an important new device. Really? And Trevor was handling all the experiments. Well, that is important. And what's more, Mr. Keene? Yes, Mr. Wallace. When I went to his lodgings to make a check, I found that several strangers had taken rooms there recently. Really? Well, we'll have to look into that. But first, I'd like a few more facts on Trevor's professional background. Wallace can give you all that, Mr. Keene. Yes. In fact, I've dug up his folder from my files. Oh. If you don't mind reading it to me. Yes. Oh, dear me, my glasses. I'm half blind until they finish making me a new pair. I'll read it myself, then. Notice Mr. Trevor came here only six months ago. Yes, that's correct. Before that, huh, by all his previous experience, was a school teacher. Yes, quite so. Six months as chemistry instructor in the Tappingworth School for Boys. Before that, six months at the Jones Walton School. And then sick for a year in Nevada. Lung trouble, he said. But he was completely cured. And before his illness, 15 years at the Morton Latin School. This strikes me as very odd, Mr. Morley. What does? Here is a man who was content for 15 years to stay in one place, and then he becomes ill. When he recovers, he shows an extreme restlessness. He rushes from one job to another. Well, he told me that after he recovered his health, he started looking for better jobs. And here's another point. You say he was your best chemical engineer? Absolutely. But all his past experience was as a teacher. Something very much different. Well, Mr. Keene, he had a college degree in chemistry, so mm -hmm. we were mighty glad to have him. What with the shortage of technicians since the war. I still think that the only explanation is enemy agents. Well, possibly. Meanwhile, thanks for the information, Mr. Wallace. I'll pay a visit to his lodgings. Whatever you wish, Mr. Keene, but just find Trevor. We need him. I'll do my best. Come along, Mike. Okay, boss. If you'd like me to show you out... It won't be necessary. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Good. I have some other matters to discuss with Mr. Morley. Good day. Good day. Good day. I'll let you know just as soon as anything develops. Well, thank you, Mr. Keene. Well, boss, what do you think? First, let's get some facts, Mike, and then we'll think. Oh, you there, Mr. Keene. Well, boss, somebody's calling. Mr. Keene. Yes, that girl over there by the machine. Yes, young woman? Mr. Keene, I heard Wallace mention your name when you came by before. You're the famous investigator, aren't you? Yes. Well, I guess you're up here to look for Mr. Trevor. You know about his disappearance? Why, sure, everybody knows. Well, do you have some information that might help me? Boss, I think she means... What do I mean? Uh, somebody stuffed him into one of them big bats. <laughs> oh, no. What I wanted to say is, if you could get interested in women's hats... Women's hats? You might find out a whole lot more than you know right now. What do you mean by that? Uh, stop that machine for a moment. Sorry, I've got work to do. Well, please, this is important. I told you all I can. Stop it, Mr. Devon. Please, young woman, listen to me. No use, Mike. Let's get out into the hall. Women's hats. What does she mean by that? Mike, I have half an idea. On our way through the town, we stopped once to ask directions. Sure, in a cigar store. Did you notice what was next door? Oh, yes. A hat store. A very smart-looking little place. Unusual for a town like this. You think that's what the chick meant? Let's find out. <laughs> Here we 
we are, Mike. This is the place. And there's the owner's name on the window. This is Lydia Groves. This is only a hunch. But I'm going to play it for all it's worth. Okay. Oh. Nobody here. There she comes now from the back room. A brunette. And darn good looking. Mrs. Groves? Yes. That's my name. You haven't come to buy hats? No, Mrs. Groves. To ask a question. I... I don't understand. When did you last see Henry Trevor? Henry Trevor? Yes. The engineer from the chemical plant. I... I don't know him. This is a small community. You must know it. I mind my own business, which is to make and sell hats. But Mrs. Groves... And all my hats are for women. Good day, gentlemen. Oh, but lady, this is important. You've made a mistake. Good day. Very well. Good day. Come along, Mike. Boss, do you think she was telling the truth? No, Mike, I don't. Enemy agent? Mike, in my long life, I found out that a beautiful woman can cause plenty of trouble without being anybody's agent. But this fellow Wallace said... We still need more information. The only way to get it... How, sir? Let's circulate around town and dig up every bit of gossip that we can. You hang around the lunch wagons, the gas station. As for me, I'm going to get a haircut. Uh, take uh, more off the side, sir. That's right, Barbara. Uh -huh. <clears throat> uh, nice day. Oh, it's a beautiful day. I think it's going to be warm after all. Definitely. Yes, sir, definitely. I don't think I ever saw you around here before. I'm doing a job for the chemical plant. Oh, chemical plant. I believe uh, Mr. Trevor is one of your customers. Oh, sure, sure. Every two weeks. Interesting about him and Mrs. Groves, isn't it? Him and Mrs. <laughs> you know. The whole plant knows. <laughs> Funny thing. He took to her from the first day she come to this town and opened her shop. Thick as thieves, all two. When did she first come to town? Uh, she, uh, about the time my wisdom tooth was raising king, uh, last September. Uh, take more off the side. Uh, yes, please. He hung around her shop all the time? Yes, yeah, till, till folks started talking. So then they uh, took to cover. <laughs> you know, uh, Thrush Lane. <laughs> They've been meeting there every night. Rush Lane. Mm -hmm. Oh, all the spooning and mooning that goes on there. And just where is Thrush Lane? Oh, half a mile south of town, right by the factory. <coughs> what, uh, say, uh, what are you doing? Uh, you, you, you can't get up from the chair yet. Here's your money. I'll see you later. Uh, but I only done one side of your head. Baby, come back. Hey, crazy fella. Running off with only half a haircut. <laughs> No, boss, there's nothing in the underbrush over here. Well, come over to this side. Oh, Mr. Keene, so sure we've been at it for three hours already. I know, Mike. This is our only real lead. Remember what the barber said. They met here every night. Oh, boss, take off your hat just once more. I will not. <laughs> the strangest haircut I ever did see. And you such a proper gentleman. Oh. Here, help me put these branches aside. There. And you're still hoping to find Trevor's body out here in Thrush Lane. Not hoping. I'll be glad if I'm wrong. Well, there's nothing here. All right. Let's get back on the path. Mike, so far we can be sure of only one thing. What's that? Trevor and Mrs. Groves knew each other long before they ever came here. That I'm certain. You see, I found they arrived here actually within a week or two of each other. Uh, Trevor to take the job at the plant. And Mrs. Groves to open the shop. And then promptly they became friends. And then promptly... The... Yes, Mr. Keene? What are you staring at? Something there on the ground, just a yard ahead of us. I don't see it. Well, look, Mike, from over here where the sun strikes it. Oh, sure, but what of it? Just those few little chunks. Come over here, Mike. Bend down. Help me pick them up. Okay, sir. 
Okay. Here. Judging from the thickness of these fragments, I think we'd better have another talk with our friend, Mr. Wallace. And now for a moment, while Mr. Keene and Mike examine their surprising finds. Next time you meet the most successful man you know, or the most popular girl, take a good look at their teeth. Chances are they'll be sparkling and beautiful, with all the magnetism your own smile should have. Then examine your own teeth critically. If they're not every bit as brilliant and gleaming as they should be, if they show signs of being discolored by surface film, just do as thousands do. Try the new Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste. Safely, speedily, Colonos helps brush away masking surface film, revealing the natural luster and brightness of your teeth. Your druggist has an ample supply of Colonos on hand, so get a tube tonight and see what wonders it may do in helping you to add to the charm and appeal of your smile. Remember the name, Colonos, K-O-L-Y-N-O-S, Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste. And now back to the chemical plant where Mr. Keene has a quiet talk with the helpful Mr. Wallace. Yes, Mr. Keene? Is there something more you wanted to know? One or two little details, Mr. Wallace. Fire away, Miss Keene, fire away. Were you aware, Mr. Wallace, that Henry Trevor was very friendly with a Mrs. Groves? I wouldn't know about that. Well, did you ever notice what route Trevor took when he left the factory at night? Oh, uh, back to his lodgings, I suppose. By way of Thrush Lane? Didn't you ever notice whether he made a practice of going through Thrush Lane? Did he? I never had any occasion for walking there myself. No? Wallace, when did you break your glasses? My, my glasses? Why, several days ago. Where? Right here, in my office. Pretty thick lenses, I gather. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. That's why I'm having trouble getting them replaced. Wallace, take a look at these. I mean, these fragments in my hand. Well, how can I, without my glasses? Take them into your hand. Feel them. Bits of broken glass. Very thick bits. The kind of glass that might be used in the spectacle of a very nearsighted man. I don't know what you're driving at, sir. I found these 20 minutes ago in Thrush Lane. Well, the world's full of nearsighted men. Are you sure one of them didn't follow Henry Trevor into the woods last Monday night and overhear his conversation with Mrs. Groves? Uh, I'm sure that this one did not. Are you quite finished, sir? One thing more. Do you have any photographs of Henry Trevor in your files? You must have. Yes, sir. I'd like to have one. At once. Well, boss, what are you up to now? I'm going on a little trip, Mike. Where to? Back into Henry Trevor's past. Dr. Grange, you are the headmaster of the Tappingworth School? Oh, yes, for 20 years. Do you recognize this photograph? Why, yes, this is Henry Trevor. He taught chemistry here last year. Excellent grasp of his subject, too. I wish he'd stay. What can you tell me of his background? Why, he came here from the Jones Walton School with the usual references. That's all you know? Well, yes, Mr. King. Thank you, Dr. Grange. Oh, yes. Yes, Mr. Trevor taught here for one term at the Jones Walton School. He got along well, Miss Mott. Our girl simply adored him. Where had he been before? Uh, he'd been sick, I believe, for a year. Before that, the Morton Latin School. Look at this photograph, please. Is that a good resemblance? Perfect. Well, Mr. Keene, we had Mr. Trevor with us here at the Morton School for 15 years, until he became ill. Then he went to Nevada for his health, Dr. Hines? Uh, quite so. You never heard from him again? Only when other schools asked us about his references. I wonder if, uh, if you would have a photograph of him. Well, we should. Any one of the yearbooks. 
You let me see on this shelf up here. Oh, yes, the yearbook of 1940. That will do very well. Well, there we are, Mr. Keene. You say that's Henry Trevor? Of course. Well, let me show you a photograph, Dr. Hines. This one. Hmm. How good a resemblance is this one? Uh, Mr. Keene, this is the strangest thing. Do you have time for a story? All the time in the world. Go right ahead. Well, Mr. Keene, I began to wonder what had happened to you. I've been away, Mr. Morley, for two days. Any luck? Any trace of Trevor? Yes and no. What do you mean by that? He's alive all right and well. I'm sure of that. Well, I... But uh, where he is and whether he wants to be found, that's something else. Mr. Keene, all I know is that I've got to have him back at the plant. He's done fine and important work here. We need him desperately. All right, Mr. Morley. That makes it a whole lot easier. Mr. Keene, it's you again. Yes, Mrs. Groves. Mr. Keene, if you've come to plague me with questions again. No. No more questions. Because I know the answer. I... I'm not feeling well. Please come back some other time. Now is the best time. You see, Mrs. Groves, I've just finished tracing back the history of Henry Trevor. Or rather, the man who called himself Henry Trevor. I don't understand. The real Henry Trevor died two years ago in Nevada. But I told you that I know nothing about it. And the moment he died, his identity was borrowed by someone else. In fact, by his brother, John Trevor. Oh, Yes, there were two Trevors, John and Henry. Both were trained in chemistry. Henry became a teacher. John became an engineer. John, the engineer, was very successful, made heaps of money. But his wife spent it even faster than he made it. I know nothing about it. In the end, this led John to embezzle $5,000 from his company. He and his wife ran away, wandered all over the country, used up every cent they had. Because there was no job that John could apply for without giving himself away. Interesting, but I don't see how... Finally, that... two years ago, the real Henry Trevor, the quiet schoolmaster, died. Immediately, John saw a chance to borrow his brother's identity, make a new start. And so John became Henry. How... how did you find all this out? By going back to the Morton School. The headmaster remembered the scandal about the embezzlement very well. And how much sorrow it caused Henry at the time. All that I had to do was show him the photograph of the man who claimed to be Henry. Quite simple, really. This is John Trevor. What did you call me? You are the wife of John Trevor. The man I've been asked to find. Oh. I... I don't suppose there's any use now to deny it. None. Yes. It was my extravagance that caused the trouble. I wanted things John couldn't afford. Believe me, I regret the whole thing. We we struggled so hard to live it down. But Wallace found out, the man at the chemical plant. Yes, by by following us to Thrush Lane several times and overhearing our conversation. And then he tried to blackmail your husband? Yes. And last Monday night, after John left me, Wallace came along again to ask for money. Five hundred dollars. Otherwise, he would expose John. But your husband refused. Yes, he, he began to scuffle with Wallace. But then he became frightened and decided it was no use. He decided he'd have to run away once again. Where is he now? Don't ask me. Please don't. But you must tell me. No. He's my husband. And this was all my fault in the first place, Mr. Keene. It was my foolishness and vanity that caused John to embezzle the money. Oh... Please go now. But, Mrs. Trevor... I beg you, please The go. telephone. Mrs. Trevor, the reason that you want me out of here, would it be because your husband is right now calling you on the telephone? I have nothing more to say. Pick up the phone, Mrs. Trevor. Answer it. But, Mr. Keene... And tell your husband I want to see him in my office in New York. Any time tomorrow, if he can make it. I... I don't know. Please do as I say. You won't regret it. Well, boss, do you 
think he'll come? I have every hope, Mike. But it's almost five in the afternoon already. Ah, oh, no. He won't come. Not a guy who embezzled five grand and stole his brother's name. There's one thing you've overlooked. What's that? Come in. Good afternoon, Mrs. Trevor. Good afternoon. You came alone? No. Not alone. Oh. You're John Trevor? Yes. Come right in, both of you. This is Mike Clancy, my assistant. How do you do? How are you? Sit down now. Mr. Keene, my wife says you insisted on my coming to see you. I wouldn't have done it except I was sick of hiding. Trevor, I want to ask a question. If you had the chance to make restitution for that $5,000, would you do it? Mr. Keene, why do you think we've been slaving for the past two years? I had any job I could get in Lydia in one hat shop after another. Save enough money to pay back. Well, why didn't you get in touch with your old firm? Because we've only got $2,000 so far. Because I was afraid of what attitude they might take. Well, Trevor, there are two things that impress me about this case. First, that you and your wife have worked so hard ever since you made that mistake. Second, that you proved yourself so valuable to the war effort. Oh, it's nice of you to say that, Mr. Keene, but... No buts. I'll be glad to accept the $2,000 you've saved so far. Let you pay off the rest in installments. What did you say? I got a telegram this morning from your old firm. What? Let me read it. In view of circumstances as explained by you, we are delighted to accept your check and drop all charges against John Trevor. Oh. Why, Mr. Keene, you mean you went ahead and... I took a chance on you two. I paid off the $5,000 with my personal check. Oh, how wonderful of you, Mr. King. It certainly is, but, but there's still Mr. Morley. I've already made your excuses to him. Well, what did you tell him? The truth. The best excuse of all. And he still wants me back? He'd be very much obliged if you'll take the next train out of here for Connecticut. Oh, Mr. King. You'll find one little change, though, at the factory. What do you mean? Mr. Wallace has suddenly resigned. Mr. King, how can we ever thank you? What kindness. What understanding. Never mind the speeches. You'll miss your train. Along with you. There's a war on, you know. Listen next week at the same time as Mr. Keene brings us the case of murder in the air. Tragedies strike deeper than the loneliness of a girl or woman who is unpopular. A girl who dresses smartly, looks pretty, is gay and charming, but whose teeth, when seen at close range, rob her of the very charm she strives for. And the same thing is true of the man who must sell himself socially and in business, and whose teeth create an unpleasant effect on others. If you have the slightest suspicion that your teeth are holding you back from social or business success, do as hundreds of thousands have recently done. And that is start cleaning your teeth with the new Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste. Its action is like that of a jeweler's polish, removing tarnish from a piece of silver. Try it just once. And then you'll know why people everywhere are changing to this new high-polishing toothpaste, Colonos, and learning the meaning of teeth that can gleam and shine, that give your smile new personality and charm. You can get the new Colonos in any drugstore tonight. It's spelled K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Kalinos Toothpaste. You've been listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Person. Now on the air at a new time, every Thursday night, 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime over this network. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday night when the kindly old Tracer turns to the case of murder in the air. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Kalanos Toothpaste and inviting you to listen to Friday on Broadway at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime over most of these stations tomorrow night.
a wonderful new way to make floors sparkle like new in six to nine minutes plan. Use Aero Wax, a self-polishing wax that goes on in a jiffy, dries without rubbing. Its marvelous high luster adds beauty to your rooms, saves countless scrubbing. Yet it costs only 25 cents a full pint. Get Aero Wax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Even the dullest, dingiest floors can sparkle like new in six to nine minutes with the economical no-rubbing Aero Wax. Just apply Aero Wax and let it dry. Its gleaming waxed finish protects against wear, eliminates frequent scrubbings and polishings. Aero Wax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, saves time, work, and money. For it costs only 25 cents at hardware, drug, grocery, or 10 cent stores. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Kalanos Toothpaste present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night from 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, the famous old investigator will take from his files and bring to us one of his most celebrated missing person cases. <laughs> to have a charming, attractive smile, teeth that feel fresh and clean, Resolve right now to use Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste. Colonos helps clean and polish teeth beautifully, yet with utmost safety. Colonos has a refreshing, minty flavor you're bound to go for, because it leaves your mouth feeling fresh as a daisy. Get Colonos. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colonos toothpaste tonight. <laughs> And now for Mr. Keene and the case of murder in the air. It is almost midnight, and in Mr. Keene's office, as the tracer and his fenster secretary, Miss Ellis, finish up a very hard day's work. You've worked long enough, Miss Ellis. Don't you think you'd better go home now? Well, there's still some more work to be done, Mr. Keene. We can finish it in the morning. Do you realize what time it is? Around nine, I should think. It's almost midnight. No. Yes. I just as soon you wouldn't come in at all in the morning. Now get a good night's sleep. I'll be here at the usual time. I had a feeling that's what you'd say. <laughs> oh, may I have the key to that closet, Mr. Keene? The key? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't have the key. You didn't take it out of the door this evening? No. Well, that's odd. Maybe Mike has it. Oh, yes. I didn't think of Mike. You want to get something out of the closet, Miss Ellis? Uh, just a book I left there. I tried to open the closet before, but it was locked. Mike must have accidentally locked it before he left. Oh, well, it doesn't matter anyway. I'm not going to do much reading tonight. I should hope not. You go home and get some rest, Miss Ellis. I'll finish up here and lock the office. All right, Mr. Keene. <sighs> Just midnight, I guess. Mm, late, even for you. I'll be leaving very soon. Good night, Mr. Keene. Good night, Miss Ellis, and thanks for staying in. I'll check this correspondence in the morning. I'm getting rather tired. Come out of that closet and keep your hands above your head. I said, come out of that closet. Well, good evening. Good evening. May I ask how long you've been in there? Since eight o'clock. There was no one in the office when I came in, and... And you waited in the closet because it was so convenient, eh? Please, Mr. Keene, I know what you're thinking, but I'm not a thief, I swear it. What is your name, young lady? Barbara Halliday. And your business here? I had to see you, sir. I have a telephone and a secretary. I usually make my appointments with her. I, uh, I was going to wait here in the office, but when I heard someone trying the outside door, I, I became frightened. That's why I hid in the closet. What frightened you? Mr. Keene, do you know what it's like to be 
Mart for murder. Please sit down, Miss Halliday. Thank you. You'll help me, won't you, Mr. Keene? I have no one else to turn to. My real job in life is helping those who've had a loved one suddenly or mysteriously disappear. There are thousands of real missing persons cases every year in this country. I know there must be a great many, Mr. Keene, but I saw your name in connection with the Bennett murder case, the singing star at the Palladium. Well, that's true. In that case, I'd been asked by a man who loved that girl to try to find her when she disappeared. But I found her murdered. Mr. Keene, do I have to wait until I'm murdered to get you to take my case? Very well put. Of course you don't, my dear. I have money inherited when my sister died. I, I can pay you whatever your charge is. The money is not important. I happen to have all I need, and I'm an old bachelor. But go on now with your story. Mr. Keene, I live in Cleveland. Up until the time of my sister's death a month ago, I'd been living with her and with my brother-in-law. His name is Tagus, Chester Tagus. I see. After Grace's death, I decided I needed a rest. It was all too much for me. We were very close. And her sudden death was a blow. Her uh, sudden death? Yes, Mr. Keene. Go on, please. I arrived in New York about two weeks ago. And that's when things began to happen. What things, Miss Halliday? Three attempts were made on my life. Any one of them could have been my finish. Frankly, I, I don't know yet why they all failed. Well, tell me about them. The first occurred on the street, in full view of several people. And where was this? Uptown, near Columbia University. I, I'd gone up to the university on a sightseeing tour by myself. I took a Fifth Avenue bus and got off at 110th Street. But the university is at 116th. Yes, I know, Mr. Keene, but I wanted to walk for a few blocks. I had an uncomfortable feeling on that bus, as if someone were watching me. I walked up the drive to 113th Street and then turned east toward Broadway. Do you know the streets? I think so. A few apartment houses, mostly four-story walk-ups. Halfway up the block... Some workmen were about to lower a piano to the street. They were moving it, apparently. There was a large pulley on the roof, and they had the piano halfway through a window. I only half noticed those things as I walked up the street. My mind was on something else. Oh, what? A man was following me. A man in a dark coat, the collar turned up, dark glasses. There were other people on the street, and I got the feeling for a moment that it was all very silly... What harm could a man possibly do in a street full of people? That's how I argued to myself. For a moment, I thought of running. I walked faster. So did he. But suddenly, I decided to face him, and I turned. What do you want? Uh, pardon me, ma'am? You've been following me. What do you want? I'm terribly sorry. I, I didn't mean to frighten you. I'm a stranger in New York, and I wanted to ask directions. You could have asked someone else. Of course. I'm sorry. Uh, do you have the right time? 4.30. 4.30. You're very kind. Now, will you please go? It was the piano, Mr. Keene. It hit a projecting ledge as it fell and missed me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you this right now. You think that was deliberate? I know it was now. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm convinced that that man kept me there under the piano until his accomplice opened the pulley on the roof. Well, I... Uh, I don't want to sound skeptical, Miss Halliday, but don't you think it was quite a coincidence that you happened to walk up a certain street at a certain time just when some workmen were removing a piano? This is my explanation, Mr. Keene. may not be logical to you, but I believe it. There were two men following me. They actually had a different plan in mind, but they saw the piano. And they made their attempt with that on the spur of the moment. And the workmen saw nothing? No. There was no one on the roof at the time. Hmm. You say there were three attempts to kill you? Yes. The second attempt occurred on the subway. The following morning, I decided to visit the Cloisters. I took a subway at 42nd Street and Express. At what time was this? Around 11 o'clock. It wasn't the rush hour, and I, I was alone in the rear car. 
At least I thought I was alone. Until I noticed a man sitting at the other end. The same dark glasses, dark coat with the collar turned up. He disappeared in the confusion right after the piano fell, and there he was again. I watched him out of the corner of my eye. When the train reached 59th Street, he'd moved his seat, and he was now directly opposite me. Didn't you try to get out? I was afraid to move. I prayed that someone else would board the car, but it was still empty except for us when the doors closed. And the train began to move. What happened then? The run between 59th and 125th Street is the longest on the line. I suppose it really only takes a a few minutes, but to me it seemed as if I was living my whole lifetime over again because the man with the dark glasses had deliberately changed his seat again. And he was now sitting next to me. There was no conductor on that subway car Sometimes there aren't. I started to get panicky. I I couldn't scream. We were in the last car and the noise was too strong. I got up and moved towards the end of the train. And he followed. Then I knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to push me off the train. I started to choke with fear. I, I wanted to beg him to leave me alone, but the words wouldn't come. And he was pushing me against the gate and fumbling for the catch. Suddenly, I found my voice, and I screamed at the top of my lungs. Later, I opened my eyes and found a conductor looking down at me. I'd fainted. My enemy was gone. Was there an investigation? No, I I didn't tell anyone what had happened. I just took a cab home as quickly as I could and went to bed. The next day I was ill from fear and anxiety. Every time I heard a footstep in my hall, I thought it was the man with the dark glasses. You kept to your room then for several days? Yes, I had my meals sent up. The only one I would admit was the waitress who bought my food from the restaurant downstairs. Where were you living? In a brownstone house on 37th, Mr. Keene. I've since changed to a woman's hotel in Charlotte. Go on. Well, at the end of three days, I began to get hold of myself again. I felt stronger, and I decided to leave town as soon as I could. And then one evening, Marion, the waitress, brought my dinner as usual. Who is it? Marion, ma'am. Just a moment, I'll let you in. How are you today, Miss Halliday? I'm fine. Thank you much better. I got you some tasty stew. Irish stew. I'm sure you'll like it. Thank you, Mary. Oh, my goodness. You've been leading a hermit's life up here. No friends, no fresh air, no movies. Well, I didn't miss the movies so much, but the fresh air, I could certainly use some of that. Why don't you go out for a walk after dinner? No, I, I don't think so. Oh, but it's so nice out and you'll feel fine after you have that lovely dinner. Mmm, wait till you taste that stew. Do. I had some myself, and it's super. I bet it is. Uh, do you want me to uncover it for you? No, thanks. I'll do it. Mmm. It does look good. There's hot potatoes under the other cover. Oh, they look nice, too. And under that third dish, um... Oh, I guess they must be the peas. Oh, thank you very much. Oh! What is it, Miss Halliday? In the dish, Marion. Oh! A spider. A dead spider. Do you know what kind of a spider that is? They call it the Black Widow. The deadliest in the country. What a strange story Barbara tells Mr. Keene. It continues in just a minute. Mr. Keene is broadcast to you by Colonel's Toothpaste. After all is said and done, all any dentifrice is supposed to do is clean your teeth. Thousands of folks like you and me have found that Colonel's, the high-polishing toothpaste, does that job thoroughly and safely. And Colonel's does a real job in helping remove surface film from teeth. Safely, quickly, it helps brush away that clouding surface film, which often hides the true beauty of your smile. It leaves your teeth shining clean looking their loveliest. 
Run your tongue over your teeth, and you feel the difference. Look in the mirror, and you see the difference. What's more, you'll be delighted with the pleasant, minty taste of Colonel. You'll find it leaves your mouth feeling cool and fresh as a May morning. If you do not already use Kalanos toothpaste, won't you try it soon? That's spelled K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Kalanos toothpaste. Now back to Barbara and Mr. Keene. You say the spider was dead, Miss Halliday? Yes. It may have been dead when it was placed there. I don't suppose the waitress knew anything about it. She was just as frightened as I was. See, I have a theory, Miss Halliday. I don't believe anyone was really trying to kill you. If they wanted you dead, they could have accomplished it in the subway or in some other less complicated way. But you do believe all this has happened to me? You, you don't think I'm making it up? No, my dear. I believe you. But I think they've all been merely attempts at murder, attempts to frighten you. But why? That's what I'm going to find out. Are you say you're living at the Charlotte? Yes, sir. You believe you're safe there? Safe as I could be anywhere. Well, suppose I see you home now. I must say this is one of the most peculiar cases I've ever had. And if it's in my power, my dear, I'll solve it for both of us. And you say Mr. Keene won't be in until noon? I doubt it, Mr. Tagus. My name is Clancy, Mike Clancy. I'm his assistant. Can I help you, sir? Well, perhaps. You see, my sister-in-law disappeared from our home in Cleveland. When was this, Mr. Tagus? Two weeks ago, following my wife's death. I know she came to New York, and I've heard of Mr. Keene's marvelous work as a tracer of lost persons. I was... Well, I was hoping he might be able to help me. What is your sister-in-law's name, sir? Halliday. Barbara Halliday. Uh, I have a picture of her here. Oh, I see. Well, if it's just a simple case... Well, I'm afraid it isn't, Mr. Clancy. Simple, I mean. Oh. You see, Miss Halliday is not... well. She has what you might call... hallucinations. Oh, I see. As a matter of fact, sir, there's no question about it. About what, Mr. Tagus? My sister-in-law, Barbara, has lost her mind. <laughs> He said she'd lost her mind, Mike? Yes, Mr. Keene, sir. And according to Mr. Tagus, she tried to run away from home on several occasions. He was going to put her under the care of a doctor when this happened. And she has hallucinations? Yes, sir. She thinks someone's trying to kill her. Hmm. What sort of a man was this Mr. Tagus, Mike? Oh, very pleasant. Nice to talk to. He was mighty worried. I told him you might be able to find the girl if he gave you a little time, sir. I have found her, Mike. You what, sir? Keene's office. Eh? Well, just a minute, please. Cleveland Collins. Thanks, Mike. Hello? Oh, yes, Inspector. You received my wire? Well, it's just a hunch. I suggest you call the coroner and consult with him. Yes. Yes, you can reach me here in my office. Very well, Inspector Bragg, and thank you. What's this all about, Mr. Keene? I can't explain now, Mike, because all the pieces don't fit. But I'll try to give you a slight idea of what's been going on while we're on our way. On our way where, sir? The Charlotte Hotel. I'm going to make an offer to Miss Halliday, and it's probably the strangest offer that's ever been made to anyone. Let's go, Mike. <laughs> We can talk here in the lobby, Mr. Keene. This is my assistant, Mike Clancy. Uh, Miss Halliday. How do you do? I'm glad to know you, miss. Sure, and I just met your brother-in-law. A brother-in-law? Here in New York? Uh, well, he... uh, we haven't got much time, Mike. Do you mind? Oh, no, of course not, sir. Miss Halliday, I've been thinking over everything you told me about your home life. And I've been trying to make some logic out of those details you've given me concerning your sister and her husband. Now, you say you were always on good terms with him? Oh, always, Mr. Keene. Well, the only thing is, I, I believe he sometimes resented my presence in his home, but that was only natural. 
When he married Grace, he didn't bargain for a third party. Well, that's neither here nor there at the moment. I've thought of one way in which we might be able to catch the would-be murderer. But it involves a good deal of danger. I'm not afraid, Mr. King. Well, first let me explain my plan and then give me your answer. Now, it's obvious that this man will make another attempt to kill you. I say it's obvious because he has something definite in mind. He wants you to believe you're in great danger for some reason. Go on, Mr. Keene. When a hunter in the African jungles wanted to bag a tiger, he'd set a lamb in the trap. Well? Would you be the lamb? You want me deliberately to expose myself to him? Yes. All right. Now, wait. Don't give me your answer so quickly. Let me explain the greatest danger of all. Up to now, as I've told you, he's only been bluffing, in my opinion. Just trying to frighten you half out of your mind. Well, if he discovers that you have help, and that you've set a trap for him, he may want to really finish the job this time. I understand. And you're still willing to do it? I'd rather take that chance than live like a hunted rabbit for the rest of my life. That's how I'm living now, Mr. Keene. And I can't stand it any longer. I can't stand it. Oh, there, there now. All right, Miss Halliday. <laughs> We're going to help you, I promise. Now, here is the plan. <laughs> This is it, Miss Halliday. The Brooklyn Bridge. Mr. Keene wants me to walk across it alone, Mr. Clancy? Yes. I'll follow you, but from a distance. We want to give this killer plenty of rope. It's very foggy tonight. So much the better. The bridge seems to be empty now from here. People don't usually walk across it on a night like this. There's plenty of traffic going across in cars, but, well, they won't do you any good in case you get into trouble. I realize that. Oh, somewhere on that bridge, Mr. Keene is waiting. I only hope he's waiting in the right place at the right time. I have enough confidence in him, Mr. Clancy. I'm not afraid. Well, good for you. Be steady now and keep your wits about you. You can rest assured that Mr. Keene will be there when you need him. Well, goodbye, Mr. Clancy. No, no, no. Not goodbye. Just till we meet again. And good luck, Miss. doing here? Well, that's just what I was going to ask you. Oh, I was just walking. My dear, do you realize how I've been searching for you? I've come New York. I'm sorry I left so suddenly, Chester. I, I didn't mean to worry you. Haven't you been well, Barbara? Yes, I've been. Oh, this is just about the most peculiar meeting I've ever had. Is it? Oh, don't you think it's a coincidence to meet on Brooklyn Bridge in a city like this? Well, no matter. Come, we'll go home, Barbara. No, I can't go home. What do you mean? Chester, I... I can't explain now, but... Someone's been trying to kill me. What? I know it sounds crazy, but I have absolute proof. Have you? And... Someone is going to help me find this man. Who, Barbara? I can't tell you that. But you say you have proof. Yes, I... I'm going to the police tomorrow as my benefactor and... Wait. Just stop here for a moment. Hmm? Why? I have very bad news for you, Barbara. What is it? I'm the one who's been trying to kill you. You're joking. Was the piano a joke? Or the subway? Chester... Don't scream. It won't do you any good. There's no one about. Please, Chester, don't, don't look at me like that. Your eyes. Chester, you're mad. We're in the middle of the bridge. It's a long drop from here, my dear. They say Steve Brody did it. I don't see how he could have managed it and lived, do you? No, no. You have $50,000 in trust, Barbara, which will go to me. He's going to meet you here. Goodbye, to Barbara. Me, no. Get out of my way. Mike, he's headed your way. You won't get far, sir. 
We've got you between us now, Mr. Pegasus, and there's no escaping. No funny business now, mister. This gun really works. Stand back, you hear? Stand back! He's climbing the rail! He's going to jump! Stop him, Mike! I'll get him! <laughs> Got you, Tagus. Don't try to pull a Brody on me. Get away from me. Get away from oh, me. Oh, no, you don't. I got you, and I'm saving you for the police, me fine feathered friend. <laughs> Feeling better now, Miss Halliday? Much better. Thank you, Mr. King. I brought you back to my office before taking you home. Because I wanted to show you this wire from Inspector Bragg in Cleveland. Shall I read it to you? Please. Mr. Keene, I'm so mixed up. As well, you will be quite a shock. Have definite proof that Grace Tagus was murdered. Handkerchief found in Chester Tagus' trunk contained traces of poison. Have wired New York police to hold Tagus. Thanks, Bragg. Dear God. Poor Grace. You thought your sister was attempting to exterminate ants in your home when she accidentally breathed some deadly poison fumes in Saladay. Yes, that, that's right, Mr. Keene. But I'm amazed how you should know all this. I've investigated it, my dear. Actually, those fumes came from a handkerchief, which her husband used to kill her with. He must be mad. He seemed to be on that bridge. At any rate, we've got him now, and there's still another explanation for his actions in the case. Yes? Did you ever hear of a codicil in your mother's will which stated that her money was to go to her eldest daughter, and then to you, should your sister die, providing the beneficiary was sane and completely capable of handling the financial affairs of the family? Well, no. I wasn't present at the reading of the original will. Well, your brother-in-law was. I've contacted the family lawyer, the man you told me about the other day, he gave me enough information to come to certain very definite conclusions. It was then that I began to realize that someone was trying to drive you mad, Miss Halliday. And I suspected that someone was Chester Tagus. Well, apparently I was right. He would have been next in line for the money with you in the asylum. But now he'll have to face the charge of the murder of your sister. Oh, Mr. Keene, how can I ever thank you for what you've done for me? It's not necessary to thank me, my dear. The thanks I receive from seeing that justice is done is quite enough. You can go home now, Miss Halliday, with no fear or foreboding. I can assure you now, there'll be no more murder in the air. Listen next week at the same time when Mr. Keene brings us the fascinating case of the lady who didn't want to be found. Have you noticed any change in the taste of your dentifrice lately? If so, we invite you to treat yourself to Kalanos, a toothpaste that really tastes good. You'll love its tangy, minty flavor that sets your tongue a-tingle. Leaves your mouth feeling cool and fresh as a sea breeze. And children really go for that zippy Kalanos flavor. You never have to coax youngsters to clean their teeth with keen-tasting Kalanos. What a job Kalanos does in cleaning teeth. Gets them clean, looking their best. That's because Kalanos is a high-polishing toothpaste. Its action on teeth is like a jeweler's polish, removing tarnish from precious silver. Because it helps brush away masking surface film. Kalanos leaves your teeth shining clean. Ask your druggist for Kalanos. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Kalanos toothpaste tonight. You'll be glad you did. You've been listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Now on the air at a new time, every Thursday night, 7.30 to 8 Eastern War Time, over this network. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday night when the kindly old tracer turns to the case of the lady who didn't want to be found. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Colonel's Toothpaste and inviting you to listen to Friday on Broadway at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime over most of these stations tomorrow night. <laughs> Here's 
marvelous news, ladies. Aerowax gives you sparkling new-looking floors for old in six to nine minutes flat without a single stroke of rubbing. Just apply and let it dry itself. In no time at all, you're proud of your shining wax floors. A full pint costs only 25 cents. Be sure to get Aerowax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thousands of women are finding that economical no-rubbing Aerowax makes dingy old floors shine and sparkle, look like new. Just apply, and in six to nine minutes, it dries to a hard, lustrous wax finish that saves countless scrubbings and polishing. Yet Aerowax costs only 25 cents a pipe at grocery, hardware, drug, and chain stores. Get Aerowax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. <laughs> Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is on the air. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel's Toothpaste presents Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night from 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime... The famous old investigator will take from his file and bring to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. For perfectly clean teeth and naturally brighter smile, start today with Colonel's toothpaste. Safely, speedily, it helps your brush take away dingy surface stains that cloud your smile. Colonel's not only makes your teeth look their best, but it tastes as bright as it cleans. You're bound to like it. Ask your druggist for Colonos. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colonos Toothpaste. And now, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, who tonight brings us the case of the strange display. Our story opens in the shopping district of New York on Fifth Avenue during lunch hour. Two girls pick their way across the street through traffic. They're heading toward the show windows of the smart Morley department store, now celebrating its 100th anniversary. You know, Sally, we really should be getting back to the office. Oh, please, we need to only take a minute and I'm dying to see their new windows. Oh, you and your boyfriend. Hey, look out for that taxi. <laughs> oh, I'm all right. You know, Jeff thought up this idea all by himself. So Mr. Barton stole the credit as usual. You and your boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff was working on the display all night. This is sort of like an opening performance. Here we are. Yeah, if we can get through that crowd. Uh, I beg your pardon, sir. Would you mind letting us... Oh, thank you. Here, Rita. This window, please. Okay. Oh, what an old-fashioned-looking family. They're dressed in the style of a hundred years ago when the store began. Look at that. A whole family sitting in their 1844 parlor. That's Jeff's idea. You and your... <laughs> Sally. Yes? Look at the old gentleman sitting by the fireplace. What about him? His white whiskers have fallen off and... <laughs> it's not a dummy. It's alive. It's not alive. It's dead. Oh! Wanted for murder, Jefferson Jones, age 26, window dresser at Morley's department store, he is believed responsible for the fatal stabbing of his superior, Wendell Barton, last night while both were engaged in dressing the windows. Jones is 5 feet and 11 inches in height, physically slight. The body was found propped up in a display window this morning. Here, my dear. Please sit down. Mr. King? Now, your name, please. Sally Wilson. <laughs> come, come, Sally. Maybe it isn't that bad. <laughs> it couldn't be worse. Well, what's the trouble? Has someone in your family, someone you love, disappeared? Mr. King... Did you notice the article in the newspapers today about 
About Morley's department store? Oh, yes. The store window's designer was found dead in the window. I believe the police are looking for his assistant. Yes, but Jeff Jones, the boy I'm engaged to. Oh. Mr. Keene, I'm told you can find anybody who's disappeared. Find Jeff. Bring him back. I beg you. The police are hunting for him already. You'll never give up to the police. But to you... You want me to bring him back to face a charge of murder? I know it looks bad for Jeff, but running away is no good either. It never settles anything. Help us, Mr. King. Well, I'll have to know all the circumstances. I gather from the newspapers... The newspapers don't know half of it. Jeff is so shy, never sure of himself. Yet he's so talented and fine. Maybe he has this inferiority complex. Maybe it's because he's nearsighted. Anyhow, he's the sort of person somebody's always trying to walk over. In this case, Mr. Barton. The man who's been murdered? Yes. Mr. Barton was a very high-priced window designer. Conceited and always picking on Jeff. For instance, Mr. Barton sarcastically called Jeff the great artist and Mr. Shy. Jeff didn't like it. Well, when the war broke out, Jeff decided to enlist in the Marines, but was rejected because of his eyes. Yes, my dear, go on. So he had to go back to his job. And how Mr. Barton rubbed it in. <laughs> hey, Mr. Shine, shot any Japs lately? Stop it, Mr. Barton. The great artist has landed. The situation is well in hand. Mr. Barton, <laughs> from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Mr. Barton, there's nothing funny about wanting to fight for my country, do you hear? All right, great artist. Get back into the window. Not a very pleasant character, Mr. Barton. Then Jeff took me to a dance of all the store employees last week. And what? Mr. Barton kept telling me how pretty I was. He asked why I wanted to be engaged to a fellow like Jeff. Hmm. A ladies' man. Well, that night Jeff was ready to hit him. But I took Jeff aside and told him not to mind. He kept talking of quitting. Oh, it's no use, Sally. I, I can't work with that guy. But, Jeff, darling, they're giving you a raise next month. Everybody knows how good you are. Me? I'm just a nobody. Stop running yourself down, Jeff. Believe in yourself the way I do. Sally, you're swell. You always make me feel so good. So important. To me, you're the most important man in the whole world. Sally, how soon can we get married? Anytime, Jeff. Next week, if you want. Okay, baby. Next week. And I'll try to forget about that guy. So, you are getting married this week, Sally? Yes, Mr. Keene. But now this has happened. Mr. Barton has been murdered. The police are looking for Jeff. And, and I've got nobody to turn to but you. Find him, Mr. Keene. From all you tell me, Barton was a miserable man to work for. Jeff had very little reason to like him. Yet, if Jeff comes back, he faces a murder charge. I know it. But bring him back to me, Mr. Keene. Then we'll face what comes after that together. I know he's innocent. One moment, my dear. Hello, Mike? Get ready to leave the office with me in five minutes, please. Where to? The morgue. To the morgue? Yes, to look at the body. In working in a case like this, Sally, I'm taking nothing for granted. <laughs> Nancy? Saints preserve us. I have. Oh, thank you, Captain Thomas. Pull the sheet over him again. Stabbed through the heart he was, as you can see, Mr. Keene. And the weapon was... We believe it was a long, sharp pair of shears, the kind that window dressers use for cutting out cardboard displays. Have the shears been found? Yeah, buried away in back of the show window. Hmm. Any fingerprints, Captain Thomas? Not a one. Huh. Wiped off, were they? Or maybe they never got on in the first place, Mike. Window dressers sometimes wear cotton gloves so they won't make smudges. Well, Captain Thomas, I noticed one other thing. There was a bruise on Barton's left temple. Oh, yeah, Miss Keene. He must have got that when he fell, after the stabbing. No fracture, though. Then only the stabbing killed him. That's right. Well, thank you, Captain. Mike and I will be getting along now. Glad to have seen you. Well, boss, where to now? To the Morley Department Store to ask more questions. <laughs> To the perfume counter, Mr. Keene? Yes, Mike. Over this way. 
right by the window where Barton met his death. Well, what will you be wanting with perfume, Mr. King? I want to talk to that young lady who sells it. Oh, oh, a blonde and very razzle-dazzle. Mike, keep your mind on business. Oh, miss. Yes? Can I help you, gentlemen? Perhaps. Here is my card. What? Well, you're the same as Mr. King. I've been engaged to work on the unfortunate accident that happened here two nights ago. I have the permission of your personnel manager to talk to all the employees. Wasn't it dreadful? Who would ever think that shy, quiet Jeff Jones would... May I ask your name? Irene Harvey. But I don't know anything about it, really. Well, Miss Harvey, how late are you usually on duty here? Till 5.30, when the store closes, Mr. King. I'm told that Mr. Barton and Jeff Jones started dressing the windows here at about 5.15 that night. I suppose. First, they went into that window nearest this counter. You must have noticed them starting. I don't want to say anything against Jeff. Poor thing, he's in enough trouble. I've been engaged to get him out of it if I can. Tell me now, did you notice anything as the men arrived there last night? Well, it... they were on the outs again. What did they say? Well, I I heard Mr. Barton say. Yes, my great artist, that was a very pretty girl you took to the dance last week. I know she is. What, uh, what was her name? Sally? I don't want to discuss her, Mr. Barton. Uh, how did a dead fish like you ever Stop get... Stop it. Stop it. All right, all right. Open that window now. Get inside. That was the last you heard, Miss Harvey? Yes. I went off duty a little later. Oh, thank you. Mike. Uh, yes, Mr. King. Let's get back to the personnel office. I want them to call in the night watchman for me. There's still a lot I want to know. A lot, Mike. You're the night watchman? Yes, sir. Bill Hankey's my name. I gather that on the night of the murder, you were making your usual rounds of the building? Oh, yes. In the course of the night, you passed Mr. Barton and Jeff Jones several times. Did you see them fighting at any time? No, sir. Nor did you see the actual killing? I was probably on one of the upper floors. Well, after the killing, it must have taken five or ten minutes to dress the dead body of Barton in the dummy's clothes and pop him up in that chair in the window display. I suppose... But you saw none of that? This is a big building, Mr. King. Well, you must have seen Jeff Jones leave the store. Oh, yes. He couldn't get out unless I passed him out. What time was that, please? Oh, about 5.30 in the morning. 5.30 in the morning? Mm -hmm. Isn't that hour unusual? No, sir. Window dressers sometimes work all night. Well, tell me, did Jeff Jones seem disturbed? Sort of white and nervous. Hmm. Did he explain why Barton wasn't also leaving? He said Barton had a few things more to clean up before the door opened. I see. Well, there's nothing more you can tell me, I suppose. You know that model cottage on the main floor, Mr. King? Yes, what about it? A couple of times during the night, I noticed Mr. Barton ducking in and out, each time a little redder in the face. You think he was drinking? That's what it looked like. Like, uh... Suppose you take a good look inside the cottage later. Yes, sir. I will. And, Hanky, one more thing. Yes, Mr. King? Naturally, everybody in the store has been very upset by the murder. But one person seems exceptionally disturbed. Who? A young lady who's very good-looking. And I have a hunch her good looks did not escape Mr. Barton's eye. Oh. Am I making sense? Barton liked any good-looking gal. And Irene Harvey, too? That was no secret. The whole store knew about those two. And so Mr. Keene makes an interesting discovery in the case of the corpse found in a department store window. In a moment, his search goes on. Meanwhile, what would you say is the first and foremost function of a toothpaste? To help your brush clean your teeth, isn't that so? When selecting a toothpaste, please bear this one fact in mind. Kalanos is a high-polishing toothpaste. It was especially created to clean and polish teeth with the greatest possible effectiveness, along with utmost safety. Isn't that the kind of toothpaste you want? You might compare the action of Kalanos to a jeweler's polish, removing tarnish from silver. 
Quickly, but also gently, it helps your brush remove unsightly surface stains. When these clouding stains are gone, your teeth look their loveliest. Your smile is brightest. Run your tongue over your teeth and you'll feel the difference. Look in your mirror and you'll see the difference. So start today the Colonos way. Your reward will be a naturally brighter, more attractive smile. The kind of smile that helps you go places in social and business life. You can get Colonos at any drugstore tonight. That's spelled K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colonos toothpaste. Now back to Mr. Keene as he looks in at another part of Morley's department store. Mrs. Ross, you're in charge of the employees' time cards. That's right, Mr. Keene. I'm very much interested in the comings and goings of one particular employee. Jeff Jones? Irene Harvey. Would your record show what time she left the store the night of the murder? Oh, yes. At 12 minutes after 6. Hmm. But right after punching the clock, she turned and went back into the store. She said she'd forgotten a package. Oh? When did she come out again? Well, that I don't quite remember. There was quite a crowd leaving at that time. Oh, boss, Mr. Keene. Hello, Mike. For one moment, please. Boss, this is very important. What is? Well, come downstairs to that model cottage. There's something I want to show you. All right. Here we are in the cottage, Mike. Well, I searched around like you told me. First in this potted plant over here, I found this. A whiskey bottle. Oh, I expected that. And something more. Look in this big upholstered chair between the cushions. Mm, a woman's handkerchief. Look at the initials. I-H. Now we're getting somewhere. Irene Harvey. Ah, uh, boss, I got to hand it to you. We've got our hands on the murderer. Will you ask Irene Harvey to step in here for a moment, Mike? <laughs> You stabbed him, Miss Harvey. It was your work. No, I had nothing to do with but it. But all the evidence shows... One that... moment, Mike. It's not so fast. Miss Harvey. Yes, Mr. Keene? All the facts show that after checking out the night of the murder, you came back and hid yourself in this cottage. All right, I did. Why? To talk over something with Wendell Barton? We were engaged, you know. Engaged? Yes. In secret. With his idea to keep it secret. And then... Lately, his eye began to roll. He stopped taking me out. Wouldn't even talk to me. So you stayed here that night to talk to him? Yes. At times, he could be charming. But that night, he was drinking. And all he would say was... Sorry, Irene. Our time is just up. Wendell, you used to say I meant the whole world to oh, me. I meant it then. Wendell... You're interested in somebody else now, aren't you? Not especially. Jeff's girl. That girl, Sally. Never heard of her. You met her at the dance. You've had nobody on your mind since then but her. Oh, no, darling. <laughs> you mean she doesn't mean anything to you? I mean, she isn't the only one. Wendell, you're horrible. I won't let you do this to me. I won't let you throw me away like an old coat. I won't. And with that, you stabbed him. I felt like it, but I didn't. Well, what did happen? Jeff called him back to the window display. Huh. It's true. A moment later, I heard the sound of scuffling. Wendell knocked Jeff down. When he got up again, he had a thick slat of wood in his hand. Wendell laughed and said... <laughs> Cut it out, you poor fool. Stop playing Marie. I'm not going to let you make remarks about Sally. Put down that slat. No, I've had enough from you. All right, I'm coming for it. He's out cold. Barton. Barton. I guess I've killed him. I didn't stop to watch anymore. I sneaked out of the cottage and went upstairs to the employee's lounge. I stayed there the rest of the night. And that was all you saw, Miss Harvey? That was all. A likely story, boss. Sure she killed Barton. No, Mike. She did not. Mr. Keene, I don't want to seem to be bothering you, but have you found any trace of, of Jeff yet? Well, frankly, Sally, I haven't begun to look for him yet. No? Finding him will take care of itself. If I can solve another problem first. 
If I can prove who really killed Wendell Barton. You're sure Jeff didn't? Well, I may have the answer in a couple of days. But first, I'm going on a trip. Where to? I'll tell you when I come back. Meanwhile, if Jeff gets in touch with you, tell him to come back at once and give himself up on my advice. If he'll listen. He's got to. Running away was the greatest mistake of his life. Oh, yes, Mr. Keene. I've been personnel manager here for 20 years. And you remember Wendell Barton? Of course. He did some very outstanding window designs for us. And why did he leave, Mr. Riley? Too much of a ladies' man. Oh, I could tell you a story, Mr. Keene. Barton left our store in a terrible hurry. On account of that trouble, Mr. Riley? That's right. Walked off a couple of weeks before Christmas. Uh, what a scandal. And the other person involved in that incident? Oh, uh, didn't stay very long either. Went just about a month later. Thank you. Now I've got it. Hello, Sally. Mr. Keene. I just got back. I dropped in here on my way from the station. Oh, come right in. Tell me, any news? The case is, of my dear, except for the testimony of one certain witness. Who? Jeff himself. I haven't heard from him. Well, if I'm forced to do it, I can present my evidence without him. But it means a long, slow, methodical search all over the country. Oh, one moment while I answer, Mr. King. Hmm. Hello? Oh, dear God. Jeff, darling. Jeff. Oh, darling, why did you ever run away? You were afraid my name would be dragged into it. Oh, Jeff, that was wonderful of you. But now you've got to come back and... You've got to. Oh, Jeff, please listen to me. Sally, give me that phone. Jeff, hold on for a second. Hello, Jeff? No, you don't know me. My name is Keith. No, this isn't a trap. In the name of heaven, not... Don't hang up. Now, listen to me. I want you back in New York tomorrow morning at police headquarters. Yes, in the office of the Homicide Squad. Don't argue. Do as I say. Come in. Oh, it's you, Mr. Keen. Good morning, Captain Thomas. Is he here? Yeah, in the next room. He gave himself up, just as you predicted. Ah, and the girl? With him. I'm sorry for the poor guy. Maybe the jury will let him off with 20 years. Or maybe he'll never have to face a jury. He's the other person here, too, that witness I asked you to have here. On the way over in the patrol car. Well, we can start in the meantime. Now, this way. Mr. King. Hello, Sally. That's Jeff, I presume. Hello, Mr. King. I came back and you say so. I hope I won't regret it. Jeff, I'll only ask one question. Did you stab Barton with those scissors? No, no, I... I hit him and left him lying on the floor. But I didn't... All right. Now then, Captain Thomas. Yes? You know my theory. It was after Jeff left Barton lying on the floor unconscious that the real murderer came along and struck. But this so-called real murderer... A person who is not quite sane any longer. Not after ten years of brooding. Ten years of looking for revenge and fearing always to take it. I don't understand, Mr. King. As we all know, Barton was the latest man. Ten years ago, in a department store in Buffalo, there was another incident. Barton ran away with the wife of one of the other employees. He did? Soon after, she killed herself. Oh. Well, for ten years, the husband of that woman has haunted Barton like a ghost. For ten years, he has followed Barton from city to city and store to store. Waiting for revenge. Physically afraid of Barton and hating himself for being a coward. And he was in the store that night? Very much so. Come right in. They said you needed me for some evidence, Mr. King. Yes, indeed. This is Bill Hankey, the night watchman at the department store. Oh, sure. Hello, Bill. Uh, hello, Jeff. Hankey, I'll come to the point. When I questioned you the other day, I was struck by one thing in your answer. What do you mean? The point was, at no time that anything was happening in the store that night, were you around to see it happen? But it's a big store. But 
there were a lot of things happening. Well, I, I, I didn't want to get Jeff in trouble. Or would it be, Hanky, that you were covering yourself up? Covering myself up? What do you mean? The fact that you yourself stabbed Barton to death. What? You mean Barton, the big frog? Very big. And strong and sure of himself. You wanted to get back at him for years because he'd wronged you. But not until you found him lying there unconscious. Yeah, yeah, unconscious. And this time, this time... This time you were stronger. This time there wasn't any chance of his beating you down. And so you picked up the scissors... He had it coming to him. I waited. I waited ten years. And then I got him. But you won't get me. There he goes from the door. Uh, he won't break out of police headquarters. I'll get him downstairs. Uh, Captain. Yes, Miss Keen. I have the feeling that a psychiatric hospital would be a better place for him than a cell for a man. Yep. You're right. Mr. Keene. Yes, Jeff? I see now that I should never have run away. Sally could have told you that. She's a wise girl. You proved it, Mr. Keene. I owe you my life. And what you make of it in the future, you owe to yourself and Sally. You've got a great deal of talent, from all I understand. Well, don't hide your light under a bushel. Well, sir. I know you're not going to fail. And there's nothing like having a wife who believes in you fully to make you believe in yourself. <laughs> Listen next week as Mr. Keene brings us The Case of the Room That Vanished. Have wartime conditions made a difference in the taste of your dentifrice? If so, may we suggest you try Colino, a toothpaste that really tastes well. You'll go for its delicious minty flavor. You'll love that fresh, clean taste that leaves in your mouth. And say, those problem children who balk at brushing their teeth, how you never have to coax them at all if they have their own special tube of keen-tasting colonos. And wait until you see how clean colonos makes your teeth. Leaves them spick and span, looking their best. Because colonos was specifically designed to give your teeth the highest possible polish without overstepping the bounds of safety. It can help reveal the true beauty of your smile. You can get Colonos toothpaste at any drugstore. And nowadays, you don't have to turn in a tin tube. Be sure to ask for Colonos. K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colonos toothpaste. You've been listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. Now on the air every Thursday night, 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime over this network. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday night when the kindly old Tracer turns to the case of the room that vanished. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Colonel's Toothpaste and inviting you to listen to Friday on Broadway at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime over this network tomorrow night. <laughs> Ladies, there's a wonderful new way to make floors sparkle like new in six to nine minutes flat. Use Aero Wax. The self-polishing wax that goes on in a jiffy dries without rubbing. Its marvelous high luster adds beauty to your rooms, saves countless scrubbing. Yet it costs only 25 cents a full pint. Get Aero Wax, A-E-R-O-W-A-X, tomorrow. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel's Toothpaste presents Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. 
one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night from 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime, the famous old investigator will take from his file and bring to us one of his most celebrated missing person cases. When you buy Kalanos toothpaste, you get four big advantages. One, flavor. It's peppy, minty, refreshing. Two, foam. It's bubbly, busy, alive. Three, feel. It's soft, safe, non-abrasive. Four, results. It helps brush your teeth immaculately clean. Who could ask for anything more? Don't wait. Ask for Colono, a high-polishing toothpaste. That's spelled K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colono's toothpaste. And now, Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, who tonight brings us the case of the leaping dog. A strange and baffling story that began on a street corner in New York near the tracer's office. There was a modest little apartment house on the corner. And outside, a large Belgian shepherd dog stood looking up at a ground floor window and baying unhappily. <coughs> From time to time, the dog would leap with all his strength toward that closed window, only to fall back hour after hour. Of course, it attracted attention from many who passed by. And eventually from Mr. Keene and his assistant, Mike Clancy, as they were walking back to their office from lunch. Mike! Yes, Mr. Keene. Look on the corner there. That dog is still there. Oh, sure enough. The leaping dog. <coughs> there he goes again. Still jumping and still falling back. Poor fellow. So handsome and pathetic. <coughs> nice set of teeth, too. Let's have a chat with him. Yesterday I... So I'm almost put his teeth in the one fellow who tried to have a chat. Boy, it was a close shave. <laughs> well, he's, he's looking over this way. Sure, here he comes. <laughs> Gentle as a lamb. Say, boss, why don't you just tell him now? That I like him, that's all. <laughs> here you are, young fellow. Oh, what's the trouble? Locked out? Somebody forget you? No color on him, no identification. Oh. Something you're trying to tell me, eh? Well, let's go inside and see what we can find out. Inside? Boss, you've got a year's work waiting for you at the office as it is. Well, only take a moment, Mike. Let's ask those two men standing there in front of the doorway. Maybe they can give us some information. Hmm. Now we're working for a dog. Come along, young fellow. <laughs> I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Yeah, what do you want? I wonder if you've noticed this dog leaping up at that window. What dog? This Belgian shepherd, right here. Never saw him in my life. Neither did I. Been out here all morning and yesterday, too. We never saw him in our life. Okay, okay. Here, Mike. Let's go through this door. <coughs> the dog's trotted along like he knew you all his life, boss. It's a walk-up apartment. Okay. There goes the dog, heading for that first door. And that's where he probably lives. Ring the doorbell, Mike. No luck. See what's down there on the doormat. Oh, newspapers, a pile of them. Let's have a look at the date. Here, here you are, sir. Lying here as far back as five days. <laughs> hey, boss, you think somebody's dead inside the apartment? Died sudden like maybe or committed suicide? Could be. Let's call the cops. No. No, before we go that far, let's try the easy way. We'll ring the bell of the neighbor next door. Okay, sir. <laughs> Yes? Something you want? I beg your pardon, Mrs. Uh, Briggs is my name. Mrs. Briggs, I I happen to notice this dog out on the street. Oh, sure, that's Tony. Tony, eh? I gather he belongs in that apartment next door. Yes, to the old couple, Mr. and Mrs. Godwin. Well, I rang their bell and there was no answer. They just went away. Are you sure? Yes, on a vacation, I guess. I saw them get into a taxi last Saturday it was. Both of them. With the dog and a couple of suitcases. They did take the dog with them. Oh, yes. Then all of a sudden, Tony showed up here yesterday. I tried to coax him inside to give him some food. But he just kept growling. 
Very strange. Yes, I was wondering. Mrs. Briggs, you wouldn't by any chance remember what kind of a taxi they went away in. No. I happened to be standing by my window when I saw Mr. Gargan at the curb shouting for the taxi. They got in, all of them, and went away. If I may trouble you with one more question, can you tell me anything about what Mr. Godwin does for a living? He's retired, I guess. They moved in here about six months ago, and they never went outside their apartment much, except to walk the dog. Oh, oh, excuse me, I've something on the stove cooking now. Go right ahead and take care of it. Thank you very much, Mrs. Briggs, and goodbye. Goodbye. Well, boss, Mike, scribble a little note and shove it under the door. Say we've taken Tony to the office. To the office? Do as I say, please, Mike. Okay, okay. Dear Mr. Godwin, if you are looking for your dog... <laughs> oh, fellow, you're very upset. So am I, Tony. There's something about this situation I just don't like. Well, you come back to the office and we'll fix you a bite to eat. Do a little thinking about this funny business. Okay, Mr. Keene, I put the note under the door. Let's get along, Mike. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Come on, Skinner, out of the way. Okay, okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Here, Tony. Come along. This way. Hey, Skinner. Yeah, Harvey? Did you hear what name that Irishman was calling the old guy before? Sure, Mr. Keene. There's an investigator by that name. Famous. I've seen his pictures in the paper. Me too. That's the guy. What makes him come snooping around here? This one of those accidents. There's officers around here. They don't like it, Skinner. I better keep an eye on the old guy. <laughs> Two days gone by and you're still hanging on to this dog. You take him home every night, you bring him back in the morning and keep him by your desk. He's becoming a regular member of the staff. Not a bad idea, Mike. Why don't you turn him over to a cop? What are you up to anyhow? Mike, I'm convinced this isn't any ordinary case of a stray dog. I don't believe the Godwins went off on a vacation. Why not? They're obviously people in modest circumstances. If they'd gone off on a vacation... The first thing they'd have done would have been to stop the daily newspaper. Maybe so, but... Uh... Something tells me that Godwin's left in a hurry, in a panic. They were running away from something. Why should two old people run away? I don't know, but I'd certainly like to find out. There's still no answer to our note. We haven't got a thing to go on. Just one clue. They left in a taxi. Mr. Key, New York's full of taxis. True, Mike. And every driver is required by law to keep a trip record. Oh, oh. Yes, a police regulation. Every time a driver makes a trip, he must keep a record of when and where it started, the number of his passengers, when and where it ended. Sure, that's right. You always see them cabbies writing things down on a card. Well, it may be a long, slow process, but if we were to check every major cab company in New York, we might pick up the trail of the old couple. Sure, but nobody's asked you to check, boss. That's just what intrigues my imagination. Mike... Get your hat and coat. <coughs> Good sign, Mike. Tony approved. Skinner, I don't like the looks of him. Just because the old guy makes friends with the dog? He's hanging on to the dog because he's got a hunch of some kind. You know King's reputation? Maybe so, Harvey. Shut up. Do like I say. Keep telling Keen night and day, as long as he hangs on to that dog. Okay, okay. That's right, Mr. Boyle. I'm looking for a cab that picked up an elderly couple at that address just a week ago today. Sorry, Mr. Keen. Wasn't any of our cabs. <laughs> You say it was eight days ago today, Mr. Keene? That's right, Mr. Horton. Hmm. No, sir, it doesn't show on our record. Well, Mr. Keene, sir, it looks like the well-known needle in the well-known haystack. Mike, we mustn't weaken. 
Sooner or later, we'll find the right cab. Ah, but how do you know it'll be worth finding? How do we know there's any kind of a case? We've got to take the chance because... One second, Mike. What's up, boss? Look, they're across the street. Two men walking along. So what? Unless I'm very much mistaken, it's the same two men we ran into in the hallway the day we first started this search. Mr. King, you're right. Mike, they're shadowing us. Yes, sir. That's the way it looks. And that convinces me. There's a case, all right. And we must get to the bottom of it. Sure, Mr. Kane. I drove that old couple in this taxi right here. You're certain of that driver? I checks all the way. The time of day, address where I picked them up. And a couple of other things happened to make me remember. Oh, tell us about them. Well, uh, I was cruising along that morning, and suddenly I hear the old gent shouting. Hey, taxi! Taxi! I look over to the curb, and there's the old gent and the lady, a door to her, a couple of suitcases. I pull over to the curb, and they get in. <coughs> yes, sir, where to? Uh, Grand Central Station. Okay, Chief. Uh, just a second, please. I'll oh, change your mind. Better make it 125th Street, 125th Street Station. Okay. Uh, yes, Sam. Uh, I think that would be safer. Poor Alice, I'm sorry this had to happen. Oh, I'd be all right, Sandy. You don't look at all well. If only we'd had time to see the doctor again. Uh, now, please don't worry. If that reminds me. We forgot to pick up your prescription at the drugstore. Driver, stop. We've got to go back. So, driver, you turned around and went to a drugstore? Uh, yes, Mr. Kane. That's when a trouble happened with the dog. The old gentleman tried to trot along to a drugstore, but suddenly a cat came along <laughs> and off went the dog down the block and around the corner. Look, Sam... Tony's gone. Now don't worry, Alice. He'll be back. Oh. Meanwhile, I'll pick up the prescription. Then eh? he'll be back. But he never did come back. We waited and waited, and finally, Mister Godwin said, "Alice, I hate to do this, but we'll have to go without Tony." Oh no, Sam. We we can't. Tony's been almost like a child to us. But if we waste any more time here, it may cost us even more than Tony. The driver get. You got them to 125th Street, all right? Yeah, but the wife was so upset, Mr. Keene, that when she started out of the cab, she went into a faint. Well, I'll be down. I helped get her into the waiting room of the station to a woman on duty for the traveler's aid. What happened next? I don't know. A cop asked me to get my cab going. And that's the last you saw of them? Right. Hmm. Obviously, they were very frightened people. Uh, sure thing. Driver, if you're free to take a fare now... I am. All right. The 125th Street Station, then. Come along, Mike. While Mr. Keene and Mike Clancy continue the search, we pause for a moment. Every day, thousands and thousands of people are discovering they can get almost incredibly fast relief from the pains of simple headache and minor neuralgia with a remarkable product called Anacin. You see, Anacin is like a doctor's prescription, for it contains not just one, but a combination of medically tested and proven ingredients. That's one reason it brings such amazingly fast relief. Many have discovered this right in their own physician's or dentist's office where they've been given an envelope containing two Anison tablets. Get Anison at your druggist next time you have a headache pain or the pains of neuralgia. Take only as directed. A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison. In handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. Now back to Mr. Keene and to Mike, his assistant, at the 125th Street Station. Yes, Miss Thompson, that's the old couple, all right. Tell me the rest, please. Well, as representative of the traveler's aid, I put myself at their disposal, Mr. Key. I offered to get a doctor. And? She refused. She said all she needed was a spoonful of her medicine. A few minutes later, they got on their train and left. Did they tell you where they were going? The old gentleman is very vague. Indiana, he said. Indiana? And that's all. Boss. 
The scheme. Yes, Mike. Look. Over there in the corner. Those two men again. Still trailing. Miss Thompson, I have a very important request. If anybody else comes along to ask you about that old couple, unless it's the police, don't give any information. Why, I don't understand. It's still a puzzle to me, too. But obviously, those two people are in some terrible danger. Please do as I ask. No, Harvey, that dame from the Travels Aid wouldn't tell me a thing. Not even where Godwin and his wife went? Not a way. We're stymied. No, we're not. Not with a guy like King working for us. Who says he's working for us? He will, if we fix it right. And we won't have to pay him a cent. Listen to this. Easy there, Tony, easy. I'm doing my best to find you. Just be patient. Patient. Boss, you're up against the wall and you know it. I do know they've gone to Indiana, Mike. You found that out yesterday, nothing since. Indiana. It's a very big place. Give it up, Mr. King. Turn the dog over to the animal society. Mike, maybe I'm just a vain old man, but I hate to admit defeat. Yes, Susie? A letter just came for you, Mr. King. Special delivery. Thank you, Susie. Very well, Mr. King. Maybe the Godwins have children out in Indiana. Maybe they... Well, I'll read this letter. Mm. Mike, this is very interesting. What's up? I'll read it to you. Dear Mr. Keene, I'm an old friend of the Godwins. I'm told by their neighbors that you were asking about them. Don't worry. They are safe and sound. Sam Godwin is a retired trainer of racehorses. Oh, a trainer. And he and his wife have gone off to visit some friends on the training farm. If you don't mind keeping the dog, they'll pay you all the expense when they come back. It's signed, Arthur Ross. Ross, that letter is a phone. Why? Well, if the friend knew that they were on vacation, how would he happen to drop in at the house and find out you were investigating? That's a good point, Mike. The next question, why was this letter sent to me? Why, sure, plain as day. The man who wrote it wants to steer you off from looking for the Godwin. He wants to make you give up the search. Oh, Mike, I've got another theory. Just the opposite. Well, what do you mean? This letter was written to spur us on. What? The writer knew it would sound fishy. Knew it would make me worry even more. Also, he went out of his way to give us a clue that may help find the Godwin. Well, you mean that this... Mention that Godwin is a trainer of racehorses. Since we know the Godwins went to Indiana, as the writer probably does not, that narrows down the search. You see, there are any number of obscure little half-mile tracks out in Indiana. Sam Godwin may have gone out there to work at his trade, in a place his enemies mightn't think of looking. Ah, but still, why would these enemies want to put you on the trail? Why? So that I'll do their work for them. So that I'll act as their bloodhound. Oh, what does that mean? That if we find the Godwins, so will their enemies. Probably. Those two gorillas who have been shadowing us day and night, Mr. Keene. Yes, Mike. Go on with the search now is a dangerous risk. But we are going to take that risk. Steady, steady there, Lightning. This gentleman wants to talk to us. Mr. Williams, if you'd rather I came back after the race... No, no, My name right. is Keene. I'm an investigator from New York. Oh, yes. I'm trying to locate a trainer by the name of Sam Godwin. I wonder if you know him. Sam Godwin? Oh, sure. Yeah, he's old, but he's one of the best men in the business. Oh. Have you run into him by any chance? <laughs> well, you see, Godwin's a big shot, Mr. Keene. Uh, you wouldn't find him around a dinky half-mile track like this. Not here. Well, uh, are there any other race meetings going on in the state? Yes, there's a small one over here at Haverford. And there's the spring carnival, carnival over at uh, Beresford. But I don't think that you'll find it. Well, thank you, Mr. Williams. I'll have to check that for myself. <laughs> yeah, Mike, this must be the office. Okay, boss. I'll knock. Come in. 
Yes, gentlemen. I'm told you're in charge of the racing program at the carnival. Yes, sir. You want to make some entries? No, I just want to have a little talk with you, Sam Godwin. You've made a mistake. My name isn't Godwin. I'm told otherwise. But just to prove it, Mike, go back to the taxi outside. Uh, yes, sir, I will. And just open the door of the cab. Uh, yes, sir. I get it. Who are you? What do you want? I think I can explain most quickly by showing you my card. Have a look. Your name is... Oh, you're the famous investigator. <laughs> Tony, old boy! Tony, we thought you were gone for good. Poor fellow. I think this proves my point. You are Sam Godwin. How did you ever find Tony, Mr. Keenan? And what brought you here? I won't go into that right now. I'll tell you only this. You're in danger. I... I know. Even more than you suspect. I may be able to help you, but only if you'll trust me. Come, I think. Tell me what the trouble is. Mr. Keen, I... All right. I'm sick of running away. I might as well tell you. Up to last year, I worked the biggest tax. I minded my own business, which was to produce winners. Then last year, just before one of the biggest races, two men came to see me at my hotel. They introduced themselves. My name's Harvey. This is Mr. Skinner. I'm well, pleased to meet you. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Godwin, we think you're the best racing trainer in this country. Well, thanks for the compliment, but in fact, with the way you've been handling uh, Lady Checkers, we don't see how she can lose tomorrow. She'll win by ten late. That's just what we don't want her to do. What? Cards on the table. We represent a gambling system. It's worth more to us if Lady Checkers loses. We'll pay you five thousand dollars if you fix it. Get out of here. We can go up to ten thousand dollars. I never threw a race in my life. Get out. Fifteen thousand dollars. Just a little shot of dope before the race to slow her up. What do you say? I'm sending for the police. Take your hands off that phone and listen. You got a sick wife. She can't stand excitement. Suppose uh, you start getting beat up every now and then. You can't do that. Sure we can. Or else we make you a present of fifteen thousand dollars. How about it? Which is it? Make up your mind, Godwin. Well, Mister Godwin, what did you decide? I said yes, Mister King, to stall them off. I wanted to tell the police, but I didn't see how I could prove it. And my wife is a very sick woman. Yeah. Heart condition. Yes, I know. But I never harmed an animal in my life. Yeah, one hour before the race, my wife and I packed up and ran away. Lady Checkers won. Cost the gamblers a fortune. They've been after you ever since? They trailed me from town to town. I had to give up my work. We lived in New York on our savings. And somebody tipped me off they were looking for me in New York, so again it meant packing up and running. We were hoping that this time... One moment, Mr. Godwin. What's up? Come over here. Look through this window. Heavens above. Those two men lounging by the gate. Skinner and Harvey, they found me again. You can blame me for that. You? While I was following you, they were following me. Now I am a goner with my wife sick at the hotel alone all day. One minute. Don't lose your nerve, Sam Godwin. But what can I do, Mr. Keene? You can take the bull by the horn. How? How? Listen carefully. Tonight, Mike Clancy and I are going to the station to take the night train out of here. The moment we're gone, I know you'll have a visit from those two men. And here is the only thing to do. <laughs> Having quite a bit of pain, aren't you? No, don't try to talk, dear. That sleeping powder should be working any minute now, and you'll be dozing off. That's it. Just relax. Sleep. That's it. Sleep. Uh, one second, please. It's you. You. Hello, Godwin. Surprised to see us. We're coming inside. No, no, you can't. My wife's sick. She just dozed off. So bad. Let's go downstairs to the lobby. Have ten witnesses around? No, we're coming inside. Please, my wife has a bad heart. You should have thought of that before. Before you gave us the double cross. What, what do you want of me? You want our dough back. The money we lost from the race you didn't throw. You know I haven't got that kind of money. We got a proposition. What did you tell your owners when you walked out on your last job? 
that I had to take my wife to a rest home. So you still stand all right with your old stable and all the big stables, huh? Yes, I've had a couple of good offers lately. That's what we're getting to. You're going to take one of those offers. You're going back to the big time to work for us. For you? When we want your horse to win, he wins. When we want him to lose, he loses. You work for us. And you keep on working for us till we get back our dough. And something more. No, I can't. I can't do it. Let's ask your wife what she did. Oh, no, don't wait, because she had another heart attack today. And she'll have a whole lot more if you don't get wise. Don't get her, wake her up. Please, I beg you. No! Wake up, Mrs. Godwin, wake up! Oh. Shake her, Skinner. Okay, wake up, Mrs. Godwin. Don't touch me. Hands up, both of you. What? Oh, what? Please, Reach for the ceiling. I've got you covered. Oh, yes, that guy King. Yes, my friends, I'm looking a little strange in this nightcap and nightgown. I didn't leave town after all. I hopped off the first car of the train just as soon as it cleared the station. Well, I'll see. Mrs. Godwin, fortunately, is in another room of the hotel with Tony, her dog, to take care of her. I decided to take her place here in bed, just long enough to listen and get the evidence that will send you both to prison for ten years. Ten years? Yes, for attempted extortion. All right, Mr. Godwin, phone the police. And then you can help me out of this nightgown. <laughs> Listen next week at the same time as Mr. Keene brings us The Case of the Little Black Book. The main job of a toothpaste is to help your brush clean your teeth. Isn't that correct? We honestly believe that Colonel's toothpaste will help clean and polish teeth more effectively, safely, beautifully. And here's the reason. Colonos is a high-polishing toothpaste, especially designed to help clean and polish teeth with the greatest possible effectiveness, consistent with safety. That's why you can compare the action of Colonos to a jeweler's polish, removing tarnish from precious silver. Quickly, gently, it helps take away clouding surface film. Leaves your teeth really clean, looking their best. Just run your tongue over your teeth and you'll feel the difference. Look in the mirror and you'll see the difference. So start each day the Colonos way, and let Colonos toothpaste help you keep smiling. That winning, successful smile that pays big dividends in business and social life. Ask your druggist for Colonos, a high-polishing toothpaste tonight. That's spelled K-O-L-Y-N-O-S. Colonos toothpaste. <laughs> You've been listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. On the air every Thursday, 7.30 to 8 Eastern Wartime over this network. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday night when the kindly old Tracer turns to the case of the little black book. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Colin Oskilfing and inviting you to listen to Friday on Broadway at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime over this network tomorrow night. <laughs> Famous no rubbing Aero Wax gives you beautifully waxed, shining floors in six to nine minute flat and at the cost of only a few pennies per room. Think of it, it's quick, easy, economical. Just apply Aero Wax. It dries to a marvelous luster, cuts out two thirds of your scrubbing. A full pint costs only 25 cents. Get Aero Wax, A E R O W A X. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. If you suffer from heartburn, indigestion, stomach distress due to excess acidity, try Bisodol. By neutralizing excess acids, Bisodol soothes irritated membranes, does a thoroughgoing job of bringing amazingly fast relief. Take as directed. Get minty-flavored Bisodol, B-I-S-O-D-O-L, tonight. Only 25 cents at all druggists. The following program will be interrupted to bring you any late news development. <laughs> Mr. 
Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, is on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, Colin of Toothpaste presents Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction and one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday night at the same time, the famous old investigator will take from his file and bring to us one of his most celebrated missing person cases. Has your dentist ever warned you not to use anything harsh or gritty when cleaning your teeth? If so, you'll be glad to know that Colonel's toothpaste contains no grit, no pumice, nothing that could possibly scratch precious tooth enamel. While Colonel's helps clean and polish teeth with unsurpassed effectiveness, it does so with complete safety. And remember this, Colonel's tastes as bright as it clean. You'll love the fresh, clean, cool feeling Colonos gives your whole mouth. It's a grand waker upper of morning. A grand picker upper if you smoke too much. Tomorrow, join the thousands who start their day the Colonos way. You can get Colonos at any drugstore tonight. K O L Y N O S. Colonos toothpaste. <laughs> For Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, and the case of the woman in blue. Today in Mr. Keene's office, an obviously nervous and unhappy young Air Force lieutenant awaits the Tracer's return, while Susie, Mr. Keene's attractive young office assistant, does her best to make him feel a little more comfortable and at ease. Are you sure Mr. Keene will be in soon? I'm positive, Lieutenant. You see, I haven't got much time, and this is important. I understand. Mr. Keene phoned half an hour ago and said he was on his way to the office. Uh, won't you sit down and make yourself comfortable? Well, I'm too nervous, thanks. Anyway. I beg your pardon? Oh, I, I, I was just talking to... Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I have to sit the edge. Oh, that's quite all right. I'll get it. Here, let me... Oh, I'm sorry. I hit your head like a clumpy idiot. If you don't relax, Lieutenant, we'll both be nervous, Ray. Oh, here's Mr. Keene now. Good morning, Susie. Good morning, Mr. Keene. Your mail's inside. Thank you. This is Lieutenant Lampson, Mr. Keene. How do you do? I'm very glad to know you, sir. Could I see you for just a few moments, Mr. Keene? I have a favor to ask of you. Come into my office, Lieutenant. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Careful, Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. You don't want to knock the typewriter over. Oh, I I think I've done enough damage already. (laughs) This way, Lieutenant. Ah, please sit down. Well, thanks, but I'd just as soon stay. All right. Suit yourself. Now, what's the trouble? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that the reason I'm in such a hurry is because I'm going back overseas again in two weeks when my leave expires. I'm in the Air Force. Yes, I noticed your wings. I also noticed you're wearing a distinguished flying cross ribbon and three oak leaf clusters. Yes, sir. Got them all in the South Pacific. Well, good for you. I hope to be sent to England this trip. And if I could only see French again before I leave... Aren't you? Yes, sir. Mr. Keene, I don't think you're the answer to the Lovelorn column, sir. And I know you're not dealing in service for the lonely heart. Not exactly. But, well, time is short. You see, I fell in love with a girl at a masquerade party three nights ago. Mm -hmm. Well, she fell in love with me. She gave me her address, and when I went there the next day, the maid let me in, well, in a most mysterious manner. And then also with great mystery, she announced that Miss Francia Jones had gone away two days before and would be gone indefinitely. I see. She said there was no way to reach her, and well, I could feel myself being pushed out of the house. I'm sure, sir, that something rotten is going on there. Something has happened to Fran. You mean you believe there's been foul play, Lieutenant? Well, if Francia had left town two days before, how did I come to meet her at a party just the night before? Mm. Obvious the maid wasn't telling the truth, but it may have been for different reasons than you suspect. Would a girl leave a guy flat without a word of explanation after telling him... Well, after telling him... What? Well, the thing she told me. No. Let's relax, Lieutenant. This thing may not be as bad as you think it is. Well, then you'll help me, Mr. King? 
I'd like to know who wouldn't help a man in uniform. Just a moment. Yes, Mr. King? Susie, would you come in here with your book, please? Yes. I, uh, I want Susie to take down certain details concerning Miss Joe. Oh, I'll be glad to give them to you. Yes, Mr. King? Susie, I'd like you to get the usual details from Lieutenant Lanson in regard to the missing person. Yes, sir. Now, what is Miss Jones' address, Lieutenant? Are you going over there now, sir? Well, the first thing I want to do is to find out why the maid told you that story. Well, the address is number 18 Wickersham Road. It's in Westchester. And where can I get in touch with you? Oh, I'm staying at the Hotel Page. All right. I'll call you there just as soon as I have some work. Oh, thanks very much, Mr. King. It means a great deal to me. I'm glad to help if I can. When Mike Clancy calls, Susie, would you... Please ask him to meet me at that Westchester address. Oh, yes, I will, Mr. King. And tell him to wait outside the house for me. Well, I'll see you soon with good news, I hope, Lieutenant. Well, thanks again, sir. Um, who is Mike Clancy? Oh, Mr. King's assistant. Oh, I, I thought you were his assistant, Miss. Oh, I'm one of his office assistants. And I wish you'd just call me Susie. There's no need to be formal. All right. My name is John. John. Now, the lady's name, please. Miss Francia Jones. And her age? Oh, I'd say she was about 24. <laughs> That's my age. A color of hair? Mm. What? What color of hair does Miss Jones oh. have? Well, I don't mean to sound like a police sergeant taking notes, but well, we need all those details. Of course, I, I understand. She has, well, honey-colored hair, I think. Honey-colored? Yes. Her hair is about your color. Oh, I see. Eyes. Beautiful. What color? Oh, uh, green. Height. Just high enough to make a wonderful dancing partner. Uh, uh, about five four. Weight. Oh, about. Well, let's see. I'd say. Well, one forty or so. One forty? Why, she must be. Uh... Must be what? Nothing. Oh, oh, she she's not fat. Oh, gosh, no. She well, she's no heavier than you are. I weigh 112. Oh, well, then that's what Frank you would. I've never met a man who had any conception of what a woman should weigh. But good heavens, if I weighed 140, I... Well, let's not go into that. Um, any other details that would make her easily identifiable? Scars or birthmarks? No. No scars. But what a smile. And when we met, she was wearing a dazzling light blue evening gown. She was... Well, a vision in sort of starlight. Well, the smile won't help, and neither would the evening gown. Well, is, is that all? Yes, thank you. Well, I guess I'd better go. Well, we know where to get in touch with you, Lieutenant, if we need any further details. Yes. Thanks a lot. Oh, Lieutenant. Yes? Don't worry. Mr. King will find her for you, I'm sure. Well, I hope so. Thanks for being so nice. So long. Goodbye. And good luck. Hmm. Honey-colored hair, green eyes, five feet four inches tall, 112 pounds. <laughs> well, he could just as well have been describing me. Miss Jones at home? Miss Jones? Why, yes, isn't it? I, I, I'm sorry. She, she's out of town. She... Who is it, Anna? Anna? Yes, ma'am. Who is it? A gentleman to see you, ma'am. Are you Miss Jones? I'm uh, Mrs. Jones. That'll be all, Anna. Yes, ma'am. There's no Miss Jones living here? Uh, no. May I ask who you are? My name is Keene. I'm a special investigator. At the moment, I'm working with Lieutenant Lanson. Oh, John... Were you at home yesterday, Mrs. Jones, when Don... Yes, I was, Mr. King. Then may I ask why... Before you go any further, let me tell you my side of the story. I wish you would, Mrs. Jones. I I feel so ashamed of what I did to Don. I, I know I owe you an explanation. You owe him the explanation, Mrs. Jones. But please go on. Well, I'm married, as you know now. Before my marriage, I was something of an actress. I might have had a career, perhaps, if I'd tried hard enough. At any rate... I married Everett three years ago. Everett Jones is your husband? Yes. You've heard of him, Mr. King? 
Wasn't he indicted for fraud some months ago? Well, he was indicted, but the charge was never proved. He was acquitted in both cases. There were two indictments? Yes, but, well, that's neither here nor there. I fell in love with Everett because he, well, I, I knew he could support me in the way which I wanted to live. I know he's a wealthy man, Mrs. Jones, but what has all this to do with John Lanson? Well, I'm, I'm coming to that. My husband pays a great deal of attention to his business, and I resent being neglected. Lately, I've gotten into the habit of going to the theater alone, often dining alone. It's not very entertaining, I assure you. I imagine it isn't. <laughs> the other night, I decided to attend that masquerade ball. I had dinner at the Club Palermo, and then went to the dance. I met Don there, as you know. I knew what he wanted, fun and relaxation. And I didn't want to spoil the illusion by saying I was married. The whole affair was entirely innocent. Innocent? When you permit a young soldier to fall in love with you, a married woman? I, I didn't realize it goes so far. Oh, I, I admit it was the worst sort of brainless reasoning. <laughs> I had no idea he'd fall in love. It's surprising, too, for I'm ten years older than he is. Though I don't look it when I meet up. When he showed up the following day, you decided to end the matter by pretending you were gone, is that it? Yes. I'm afraid my maid spoiled things. But I didn't want to hurt the boy. I just wanted to end the affair as quickly and as painlessly as possible. I agree with you there, Mrs. Jones. A quick ending was the only solution. If you could only understand how lonely I was and how lonely Don seemed to be. I, I know I was wrong, Mr. Dean, but that night I, I just couldn't. Telling I was married. May I ask what you propose to do now, Mrs. Jones? I don't know. Naturally, I wouldn't want my husband to know about this. And I certainly don't want to hurt Don. Don's feelings are my chief concern right now. I understand that, Mr. King. And, and if there was anything you could do to make it easier for Don and for me, I'd greatly appreciate it. I... I don't mean to be unkind, but I hope you've learned your lesson, Mrs. Jones. Why, I have. I assure you, I have. I'm ashamed and sorry. Please, believe me. Well, I'll do the best I can. Thank you, Mr. King. Thank you so much for understanding. I only hope, Mrs. Jones, there's nothing more to this case. More? Yes. Oh, I assure you, there isn't. That remains to be seen. Goodbye, Mrs. And that's all she told me, Mike. Hmm. Well, now, uh, did it sound like the truth, Mr. King? It sounded that way, yes. Ah, but she said she was an actress, sir. That's right. And, uh, sure she had no trouble pulling the wool over the lieutenant's eyes. Evidently not. Then maybe this is all just a gag. How do you mean, Mike? Well, I mean, sir, that, uh, well, maybe the husband is in on it. Hmm. Frankly, I had the same thought. And sure, who knows what they may be trying to pull on this lad, Mr. King. Sure, the husband's had a brush or two with the law before. But could it be possible that anyone would be low enough to use a soldier, a man who's risked his life for his country and his people, time and time again, as a cat? Oh, <laughs> she didn't seem to have any worries about stringing the lad long in the first place. Huh? You may be right, Mike. And if you are, I'll make them both regret it as long as they live. Yes, this case bears watching. There's no doubt about it. I'll say so, too. Meanwhile, I'm not going to say anything to the lieutenant. Not before I find a way to break the news without upsetting him too much. Call him on the telephone, Mike, and... Ask him to meet us back in the office in an hour. I'll do that, sir. Perhaps we can work something out for Don. Yes. And get to the bottom of this other business at the same time. Just a moment, Mr. Keene will continue with the case of the woman in blue. Meanwhile, if your own dentist or physician has at some time given you an envelope containing anison tablets, you're already familiar with this highly effective pain-relieving agent. 
For Anison relieves the pains of simple headache and minor neuralgia incredibly fast. And here's the reason. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, not just one, but a combination of active and medically proven ingredients. Anison comes in handy boxes of 12 and 30, or bottles of 50 and 100 at any drugstore. Take only as directed. A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison. Now back to Mr. Keene and the climax to The Case of the Woman in Blue. Returning to his office with Mike Clancy, his assistant, Mr. Keene finds Lieutenant Lanson awaiting him. Did you find friend, Mr. Keene? Did you see her? Yes, I saw her, Don. Oh, and she's safe? Perfectly safe. Well, well, then why did she... Don, I don't mean to keep you in suspense, but there's... Well, there's very little I can tell you at the moment. Mr. Keene, you said... However... Yes, sir? There's a nightclub called the Club Palermo. Do you know where it is? Yes, I've been there once or twice. Perhaps if you had dinner there tonight, you might find your friend. I understand that she is seen there often. But don't you think it might be better if I went back to her home? No, Don, and... I definitely do not. Now, take my advice, son. Drop into this place this evening. You may be pleasantly surprised. Will you and Mr. Clancy here come with me, sir? I think uh, Susie would be a better bet to accompany you, Don. Mike and I would hardly make good dancing companions. Oh, I don't think I'd feel much like dancing. I, I just want to see Fran and talk to her once more before I leave. There are certain reasons why I prefer not to go. And you really shouldn't go alone. Oh, very well, sir. But you'll find Susie a very sympathetic and interesting companion, if you care to take her. Oh, I'd be glad to. Good. When she returns to the office, I'll ask her if she's free. Perhaps if you call the office later on, then you could make all the arrangements. All right, thank you, Mr. Keene. And tomorrow morning, call me back and let me know how you made out with Francia. I will, sir. If you say it's the way it should be done, well, well, that makes it okay with me. Thank you for your confidence, Don. I'll talk to you tomorrow, then, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye, Don. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Clancy, and thanks a lot. Oh, not at all, Lieutenant. Will he uh, really meet her there, Mr. Keene? I doubt it, Mike. Francia Jones does go there alone occasionally. But I'm sending him there for a different reason. What, sir? Perhaps he is not quite as much in love with Francia as he thinks he is. The soldier on leave sometimes puts a little too much emphasis on romance, and it's easily understandable. Uh, I know what you mean, boss. Francia seemed to be the first American woman he'd met since coming back from the South Pacific. Now, if he met others... And talk to them, dance with them, he might find his attitude changing a bit. Sure, and you may be right, sir. Another thing that startled me was Susie's resemblance to Francia. Susie is much younger, of course, and not brittle and superficial like Mrs. Jones, but Susie should be a good substitute to begin with. And she might do him a lot of good. At any rate, we'll see soon enough. Wonderful place, Donnie. It's so glamorous. Yeah, I, I rather like it myself. Oh, it was very sweet of you to ask me to come. Do you see Fancy in the crowd? No, not yet. Oh, perhaps she hasn't arrived. It's awfully good dance music, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, pretty good band. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Would you like to dance with me? No, I'd love to. No point to just sitting here watching the people come in, is there? No. Susie, I, I'm sorry. That wasn't a very tactful thing to say. Well, that's quite all right. I understand, Don. Well? Hmm? Oh, oh the dance. For oh, sure. Let's go. Huh? love this song. So do I. Hey, you're a swell dancer, Susie. So are you. And 
Well, I guess I should have said this a long time ago. You look very pretty in that glittery blue dress. Oh, it's never too late to say that. Thanks. <laughs> you know, somehow I feel a little more relaxed right now than, well, than I have in days. Oh, it's the atmosphere and the music. No, no. I'd say it was more... More what? More you. Well, what was that step you were doing before? Let's try it again, huh? All right. Oh, you know how long it's been since I had lobster thermidor. Well, I guess they don't serve a dinner like this out in the South Pacific. <laughs> Key rations are a banquet out there. You know, we think we know what you soldiers go through, but we really don't here at home. Oh, we're not kicking. We've got a job to do, and we do it, that's all. Where'd you get that ring, Susie? Oh, it's a graduation ring. <laughs> I know that. I mean, what school? Oh, you wouldn't know it. It's a small college out west. Do you have any folks here in New York? No, I live alone. Oh, that must be tough. Not really. I read a lot and go to concerts. Do you like concerts? Oh, I'm crazy about them. Uh, but let's talk about Francia. I know you'd prefer that. Well, I remember discussing music with her. She wasn't very interested, I guess. Susie, who's your favorite composer? Bach. Well, that's mine, too. Oh, well, strangely enough, I also like Gershwin. Well, so do I. <laughs> Well, tell me some more about Franz. He, he must be charming. Wow, well, she's very beautiful. She speaks like, well, you know, like an actress. With distinction? Mm, yeah, that's it. You know, Susie, you have that quality, too, in a different way. A way I like. She a good dancer, too? Very good. And that reminds me, so are you. How about another dance? Love it. Let's go. Wonderful time. Are you? I'll say I am. Oh, this is one of the things we missed so much out on the island. And boy, oh boy, am I going to make up for lost time. No sign of Francia yet? I don't see her. Look, here's a new step I picked up, Susie. I think you'll like it. The orchestra's taking a rest. Oh, I wish they wouldn't. Just when I was, well, getting used to holding you in my arms, too. Susie, you're... Why, what's the matter, Don? What? Look, there's, there's Fran sitting at that table over there with a the man. Oh, will you go on over and speak to her and I'll... No, no, Susie. No, you're my date for tonight. Besides, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say hello to be polite. Come on. Good evening, Fran. Don... Uh, how are you? Fine, thanks. Oh, this is Miss Harvey. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? Uh, this is my husband, Don. Edward, I want you to meet Lieutenant Lanson and Miss Harvey. How do you do? How do you do? I'm glad to know you, Mr. Jones. Well, Fran, it was nice seeing you again. Uh, and you? Glad to have met you, Lieutenant. I'm glad to have met you, sir. Bye. Goodbye. Uh, have fun. Married him. She never even... Do you want to leave, Don? Leave? Why, gosh, no, I'm having the time of my life. I guess I just never saw her before this way. Fran? Mm-hmm. And Susie, I don't even care. I'm not kidding now. I'm glad it turned out this way. And I'm glad for you, Don. Susie, you and I are going to have an evening. We'll do the town and just talk and talk until the crack of dawn. How about it? Anything you say, Don. Maybe I'm crazy, but I feel like I'm on wings. Oh, boy, what a break I got, Susie, when I met you. Oh, dear, if I keep making these mistakes... Good morning, Susie. Good morning, Mr. King. Oh, excuse me. 
you, sir. You look tired. Oh, I'm afraid we were out very late last night, Mr. Green. Mm-hmm. Did you have a good time? Oh, we had a wonderful time. Uh, we met Francia Jones and her husband. At the nightclub? Yes, Mr. Green. Well, uh, that was something I didn't really count on. Oh, but it was quite all right. In fact, it didn't mean a thing to Don. He, he was really happy to put an end to it all. Is that so? I know he wasn't in love with Francia. In fact, I'm sure of it now. You are? Why, Susie? Well, well, I... I think he's in love with me, sir. That's something else I didn't expect. And I'm in love with him, Mr. Keene. Terribly in love. It frightens me a little. Why should it frighten you? Well, I... I just can't make up my mind about him. Could such love be real? A man who changes so quickly, would he change that way about me, too? I doubt it, Susie. And I'll tell you why. Love isn't something to be reckoned with in regard to time or place. It just happens, that's all. And when it's genuine, you know it. Of such things, romance is made, Susie. Mr. King's office. Susie? Don. How are you, darling? Oh, just fine, dear. I... Well, you want to speak to Mr. Keene? He's here. Mm-hmm. Before I do, darling, remember our dinner date tonight. I will. Mr. Keene. Thank you. Hello, Don. Hello, Mr. Keene. I suppose Susie told you about last night. Yes, she did. But you mustn't judge Francia too harshly, Don. Oh, I'm not, sir. At first I thought that, well, that they might be taking advantage of you in some way. That's why I didn't tell you everything at first. But I think it's pretty obvious now that that wasn't the case. Well, sir, that isn't very important to me right now. You've been wonderful. And in return, I, I think I ought to give you fair warning, sir. Warning of what? Well, after the war, when I come back, you're going to lose a darn good office assistant. <laughs> well, when that time comes, perhaps we can effect a compromise. Beneficial to both sides. <laughs> All right, sir, okay with me. And as far as Francia is concerned, this we must say for her, Don. She made a mistake and corrected it. Which was all the luck in the world for me. Do wartime changes make your dentifrice taste different nowadays? Why not change to Colonel? The toothpaste that really tastes keen. You'll find its delicious minty flavor, its tangy, refreshing taste, chases morning mouth in a hurry. Yes, there's a zip and a tingle to Colonos that leaves your mouth fresh and cool as a sea breeze. And while Colonos makes your mouth feel bright, it helps make your smile look its best. Just wait until you see how thick and thin Colonos helps get your teeth. They look their loveliest because Colonos was specifically designed to help give your teeth the highest possible polish Safely. You can get Colonos in any drugstore. K O L Y N O S. Colonos Toothpaste. You've been listening to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, on the air every Thursday at the same time over this network. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday night. When the kindly old tracer turns to the case of the hidden motive. This is Larry Elliott saying good night for the makers of Colin Oak's toothpaste and inviting you to listen to Friday on Broadway at the same time over this network tomorrow night. <laughs> Here's a fast, sure way to keep your home free of stinging, germ-carrying flies and mosquitoes. Use Black Flag Insect Spray. One touch and pests are doomed. Every batch is bug tested for sure death. For offensive pests like ants and roaches, get Black Flag Powder. Both on sale at leading stores anywhere. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.